I be uh, transparent for a second, fam? Something's been bugging me. I released my first feature film, Unsound, three years ago on YouTube. It's done very well for itself and you guys really seem to enjoy it. In 2019, we won nine Telly Awards for the Unsound project. This guy is second gold for producing for Unsound. I got it, Tina, Damon Mosier, and Troy Holler, all the producers of the film, got a gold for this guy. Bet that I couldn't do 10 squats with these without dropping one. No, I'm gonna drop it. <laughs> I can feel it already. Sweet, sweet. All right, now you gotta set them down. I'm gonna give you my phone and then... Uh, uh, Last year, we were nominated for a Webby Award. We are here tonight gathered to honor those who have achieved the inscrutable triumph of winning the internet. Shout out to the Webby Awards. This is the Webby right here. For anybody who's ever submitted to the Webbies, you know like the competition is crazy. So it is an honor just to be nominated. So winning awards is nice and everything, but uh, so here's what I'm thinking. We made this movie called Unsound. It was my first feature, released it on YouTube, cool. Then I made a documentary about how we made that movie. It covers script to screen, how we got the budget, how we got the crew, all of that, cool. But we're kind of missing something here, right? Like if you follow my channel, you already know the deal. I release a film, then I release a breakdown video on how we shot it. We talk about the lighting, bro. We talk about the framing and composition, the shot design, the directing choices, the blocking, the gear, cameras, lenses, sound recorders, just all of the things, bro, and how we use these elements to tell a story and create, you know, like an experience the audience can really sink their teeth into, in theory anyways, because, you know, art is subjective. I enjoy breaking my films down, kind of my thing. You guys seem to find value in these breakdowns and, uh, you you know, are you are you picking up what I'm, I'm putting down here? I've broken down all of my other films, except this one. I can't close the book on the Unsound Project until we've done a breakdown. So I guess the Unsound Project just turned into the Unsound Trilogy. We got a problem though. So. Doing a breakdown on an entire feature length film scares the pickles out of me, bruh. If I dropped everything else and only worked on this, it could take six to nine months easily. Just thinking about it makes my head spin. I don't know if it's even possible. Here's, here's the good news. If you're watching this, then, you know, I must have figured it out. Let's get into it. When we get back, I got something to see. Sarah, we're gonna need Reggie's support in order to get through all this. No, I don't need Reggie's Let's talk about gear. Most of this we'll cover along the way, but I just wanna set the table. We shot 90% of the film with my Canon 60D. We shot dual camera in a few scenes. I think we need a little context here. We shot this in 2012. At that time, the Canon 60D was one of the new kids on the block. These days, it's kind of a dinosaur. Our camera settings, bruh. Shutter speed, 1 50th of a second. Double the frame rate, ISO. We never went above 640. We shot the whole thing using the faithful picture profile. Shot full HD, frame rate 23.976. We used these lenses. We'll cover this along the way. We mostly leaned on the Canon 18 to 135 kit lens. I'd say 70% mm, of the time, that's what we were on. The second most used would have to go to the Tamron 17 to 50 zoom. Came in clutch for low light shooting. For you soundies out there, this will be different for audio. We used the legendary Sennheiser MKH416 shot mic. We recorded with the Sound Devices 702 field recorder. Crew minimal days, the Tascam DR100. For any wireless recording, we use Sennheiser G3s. We primarily used tungsten lighting sources. We had next to nothing to shoot this, so we borrowed all of our lights and all of our sound gear from my old film school.
open the film up here, at a McDonald's. Or rather, under a McDonald's. To be more specific, a wash under a McDonald's. Here's the game plan with the opening. This wash is one big metaphor. It is a place, but it's also a metaphor. Now, we haven't met Darylin yet, but this place is the external representation of what's going on inside her head. We want this wash to feel like a labyrinth. You know, every corner you turn leads to another dark passage type thing. This is the working idea that informed how we shot the location. Here's what we did. We filmed as many angles as we could of this place. In shooting this space, we tried to bring out both the darkness and the beauty, but we avoided shooting the exits. This place needs to feel inescapable. This is the very first shot you see in the film. It's both dark, but it's also beautiful. And we're capturing that labyrinth-like quality of this wash. We see deep passages with no exits. Here again, darkness, but also beauty. The maze, one passage leading to another, no escape. Love the glare on the walls here. It makes this place feel a little surreal. We're at 30-ish millimeters here. This field of view is roughly what you would see if you were actually here. We're center framed on this debris here in the middle of the tunnel. This location is already fairly geometric, as you can see. Very easy to get balanced compositions. Here we've got symmetry on the left and the right side of frame. We're zoomed all the way out to 17 millimeters here on the Tamron Zoom. We went as wide as we could go for this shot because we want to emphasize just how big this space is. We can really capture these descending rows into oblivion here. Wide angle lenses also exaggerate distance. We're getting the added benefit of pushing this exit right here as far back as we can. So it's almost like a smear of light. You don't even realize it's there. All right. All right, and action. Introducing Darylin. We're on a Canon 50 mil here. We're framed up for the lighting of the black and mild cigar. We went with a 50 mil lens here because we want to single out a few details. Who lights a cigar with a barbecue lighter, bro? A little strange. Notice the black gloves here. Could this person be dangerous? We're concealing her eyes from you. She's a stranger. We don't want you to feel comfortable with her. By keeping the shot nice and tight, we drive the focus to these few details that we want you to be thinking about so that you ask the questions we want you to be asking yourself. Who is this woman? Why is she in a wash? Is she dangerous? Is she homeless, etc. Using all natural lighting here, we're key lighting her with bounce light from the concrete. We didn't use fill light here, didn't need it. Before we go any further, okay, we gotta talk about how we're gonna handle Darylin in terms of cinematography. This was one of our biggest challenges. In order to build stakes in this film, we adopted a few storytelling techniques from the slasher film. Part of what makes slasher films work is the power of mystery. You build a sense of mystery by withholding the reveal of the slasher for as long as possible. You may show parts of them, but you never give away the entire reveal until much later in the film. If you show too much too soon, you lose all tension. No, this is not a slasher film, clearly, but we still have the challenge of building and alleviating tension for our audience. We need Darylin to feel larger than life, like a force of nature in order to build stakes. We're gonna choose shots that allow us to conceal her from you. We're also gonna give her some sunglasses. Between these two things, it should do the trick. We've got to be very strategic about how much of Darylin and her erratic behavior we're going to show you at any given time. From the second I saw this wash, I imagined opening the film on this insane wide shot. This cavernous place represents the maze of her mind, so this shot needs to feel claustrophobic. We started at 17 mil, super pretty shot, but it wasn't communicating that trapped feeling we're looking for. So we pulled back and we hit it at 45 mil. Here's that 17 mil shot. Bro, gorgeous. But it's not telling the story. We're too close to the action here. It's almost like you're there. We don't want that. Because we're wide, our dark cavernous passageways back here, they just kind of blend into the background, man. They don't feel foreboding or inescapable. This doesn't feel like a maze. The pretty graffiti and the beautiful lighting, they're distracting. We don't want that. Here is that same shot at 45 millimeters. Right? What a difference. Those dark passageways, large and in charge, bruh, bruh, front and center. The added compression really flattening these walls out here. The graffiti is not as distracting because we moved further away and changed the perspective. The composition looks more like a box. This is what feeling trapped in a maze looks like, fam. Yeah, this isn't as pretty as the other shot, but it tells the story. And lastly, bear with me, all right? 
we lingered on this shot for as long as we did because I wanted to use blocking to create a visual metaphor. You can sum up Darylin's entire character arc with this one shot. Darylin is running from her situation, which is why we find her in this wash in the first place. Her journey starts in darkness. There is a lot about herself she does not yet know. When she steps into the light, this represents her gaining a new understanding of herself and her disorder. She can now see what was once hidden from her. I also added the sound of a distant train. Again, metaphoric. Change is coming. I used this sound twice in the film. Once in the beginning, here, and again at the very end. More on that later. But the real question is, does she ever find her way out of the maze? Huh. Again, it's just a visual metaphor. You're not supposed to pick this up the first time you watch it. 80% of you cats might never pick it up, even if you watch it more than once. It's fine, not the point. This is for that 20%, the peeps who really like to dig into the movies they watch. The opening jib shot, guys, the only reason why this jib shot is here is to make a first impression on our audience. We wanna set up the expectation that we could create dynamic shots and move the camera whenever we want. We just choose not to. But the reality is moving the camera and creating dynamic shots cost time and money that we don't have. We're shooting this on a shoestring budget, people. But our audience doesn't have to know that. We used a cheap DSLR jib, threw it in the back of our friend's truck to get it, you know, an extra four feet off the ground. Position one for the jib shot, typical establishing. Nice and high, we get a sense of the geography of where this story is going to take place. One thing is for certain here, we're not in New York. Then we jib down into position two where we stay for the remainder of the shot. The car and the fellas each occupy a third, nice balanced composition. We hit the interview subject at 35 millimeters, gave him plenty of headroom and look space. We shot the entire scene at golden hour slash magic hour, easy lighting. Here we're establishing a new scene from the inside out with a close up. We're not using any lights here, just the house lights. We're meeting Reggie for the first time here and being that he's one of the main characters, we want to introduce him in a memorable way. So we just avoid showing you his face until the very end of the scene, you know, give him a little mystery. Nothing new, old school trick. This was one of the first scenes we shot, so that screen is actually a green screen. The driving shot. Damon had to stuff himself in my tiny backseat to get the shot. If you know anything about old school Beatles, you'd know that the back seat is supernaturally tiny. To get the shot, we used a full Apple box to raise the camera, a hi-hat to mount the camera, and a sandbag to weigh the camera down. This is what I saw in my rearview mirror. Damon squished up in the back seat on a 20 mil lens. Between this and Damon digging his knees into the back of the seat, we had enough points of contact to get a pretty stable driving shot. We shot this at 7.30 in the morning to catch the golden hour lighting. We rigged a lavalier in the cabin of the car for audio. We gelled the windshield with neutral density gel. Indie gel basically helps you cut down the amount of light coming through a window. In this case, we're bringing down the amount of light coming through that windshield by two stops, allowing us to expose for the inside of the car in Reggie without the windshield blowing out, bruh, bruh. Fun fact, this guy is also our makeup artist. 20 mil lens here for this sliding shot. We went with the sliding shot here for a couple of reasons. First, it works as a reveal for Darylin, but it's also another opportunity to pull our audience in by getting them to ask questions. We see Reggie speaking with a guy who appears to be upset. I mean, it's clear that this guy is going in on somebody. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Daryl. We set up a question and then we answer that question visually with one dynamic shot. Side note, we're still holding on to that reveal. We haven't shown you Darylin's full face yet. Still kind of obscuring it here with the angle and the sunglasses. Or lighting, we're filling Darylin in with a bounce board just outside of frame, camera right. Here's that shot with no lighting. And here's that same shot with little fill. Much better. We've also got indie gel on that front windshield to manage exposure. We're on a 20 mil lens here for this two shot. We need to see both characters' faces to keep the tension going. Golden hour, high contrast lighting, no fill. For mood. We get a lot of questions on how we pulled this shot off right here. Hey, 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 what are you, what are you doing? For starters, yes, this is real traffic. Those aren't actors in those cars behind us. Those are real people. Getting this whole scene in one shot was all Damon's idea. Bro, you're a genius. Thank you. You know, this shot is not as complicated as it looks. We just used a car mount. Rigged a Matthew's car mount on the passenger side door close enough for T to reach the camera so she can start and stop recording. For audio, rigged a lavalier in the cabin, ran the cable down to the sound recorder in the glove box. This was our final frame here, and we had the mic like just outside of it. I mean like, boom, it's right there. We got the whole driving scene with that mic. She just did.
on, bruh, bruh. We gotta thank some peeps. This video is sponsored by the good peeps over at Skillshare. They help to make it possible for the kid to bring you this ridiculously long breakdown. Skills are currency, my friend. Knowledge may make you sufficient, but skills make you efficient. Well, something to think about. As filmmakers, we gotta keep racking up those skills and attacking that learning curve like there's no tomorrow. And Skillshare is a resource to help you do just that. They've got classes up the yin yang on all things creative, filmmaking, photography, editing, etc. Recently, I took an After Effects class on how to get the paper cutout look. I dug it. Not sure when I'd use that aesthetic, but already got the wheels turning on some different video ideas that I can experiment with. We'll see what happens. The first 1,000 of you cats out there to use the link in the description section will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Again, a big thank you to Skillshare. Link below. Let's get back to the video. talk about my old apartment, bruh. We're shooting about 60% of the film here. A few challenges with that. One, it's ugly. It has the typical Tucson, Arizona, boxy, cheap apartment look. It's not going to look very aesthetic on camera. Two, it's small. There isn't much room for a film crew, lighting, or staging gear. And three, it is cavernous. The windows are small and the biggest window in the living room never gets direct sunlight, like because it's always facing other apartments. It's kind of hard to use natural lighting in here because the place is always dark like a cave. Instead of trying to fight against the limitations of this location, we decided to embrace it and make it a part of the aesthetic of the film. For example, this shot right here. This is the first shot of the apartment we see in the film. We're going wide here at 21 millimeters to capture the cavernous essence of this apartment. Bruh, bruh. This was our camera placement to get the shot, almost up against the back wall of the living room. It's all of the darkness that makes the shot. It sets the tone. This doesn't feel like a uh, nice, comfy place to come home to. And it's not supposed to because home is a battleground for our characters. If we take a look at false color here, we will see that most of the image is in fact underexposed. I mean, it's it's supposed to be, it's a dark scene. We shot it this way. Now this shot goes on for a while because we're fairly confident there's enough going on in the frame to hold your attention. At the top of the shot, we're planning for your eyes to go here because it's the brightest thing in the frame. And then you're just gonna kind of make your way out and take in the room. It's a nice balanced composition. We're not exactly following the rule of thirds here, but if we draw a diagonal line right here, we've got an equal amount of stuff on either side of the line. Both sides are equally weighted. And then boom, once that door opens, your eyes are gonna be glued to the right side of the frame for the remainder of the shot because the characters now inhabit the brightest part of the frame. There's nothing else moving in the shot, no other distractions. And we are telling the story through the blocking and the body language here. Those things tend to work very well in a wide. And lastly, we were going for the frame within a frame effect to give the shot that depth and keep things visually interesting as well as being able to see what both characters are doing simultaneously. All of these things combined is what gave us the confidence to hold on this wide shot. Here, we are foregrounding Darylin to make her large and powerful in the frame. And we didn't bother shooting the reverse shot of this conversation because remember, we're holding on to her reveal. These are just Mentos. The front office manager here is actually our assistant director. Let's talk about composition. We have a balanced frame, equally weighted on both sides. We shot through these doorways here to get the most depth that we could out of this location. And this bank of windows off to the left-hand side here is doing all of our lighting for us. If you're shooting a low budget feature, bro, windows are your best friend. We staged this entire scene up against these windows to take advantage of all of that free, beautiful, soft window lighting. And these blinds here are doing an amazing job of diffusing that light for us. We flew in a little bounce board for Phil to get some of that 3D action here. And that was it for lighting. We started this scene off with close-ups to keep that tension going. We wanna see every micro expression on each of these actors' faces. We saved the wide shot for the end. This is not a balanced composition. Reggie feels off kilter in this scene. He just got threatened. We wanted to do a little something with the framing to reflect that. If you saw this shot and you felt irked <laughs> that it wasn't balanced, mission accomplished. This is one of my favorite shots in the film. We're shooting from the bathroom on the Canon kit lens at 100 mil through the bathroom doorway into the living room, but we are focused on this bathroom door here to keep Darylin out of focus. At 100 millimeters, that field of view is pretty narrow, bro, bro, and we're getting a lot of lens compression. I want Darylin to feel like this dark figure lurking around the house. That is why we went with 100 millimeters here. Not only do we want to throw Darylin completely out of focus, but that compression is magnifying this window, making it appear much larger, so we can get a nice silhouette of Darylin up against that window. And we're also getting a nice shallow depth of field, even though we're at f5.6. This is just another instant 
extents of us holding on to that reveal. I mean, she is the only thing in the shot and she's still out of focus. We're like teasing you guys at this point. Just to drive the point home, let's do a comparison. Here's the version we used with the out of focus beautifulness. And here is an alternate version with everything in focus. See what I mean, right? Like the in focus version just kind of feels eh, pedestrian. It doesn't have the same atmosphere. Just a reminder, our entire budget is the equivalent of one day of craft services on a Hollywood set. Meaning we don't have any money for locations. We can only afford to shoot in places we can get for free. Since we went to film school at the University of Arizona, we knew some peeps who could help us out. We were able to get an office at Campus Health for Vic. Vic the caseworker is a, he's an important character, but not a pivotal character. So we decided not to give him the special introduction treatment. The first time we see him, we're cutting away to him like we'd cut to any other character. Since he's framed up against this back window here, we had to give him some fill. Just as an example, here we have no fill. It's not terrible, but it's not the best either. He's kind of dark. And here we've got some fill from the side. This is behaving a little more like a key light, but you get the idea. He's not as underlit as he was before compared to that window. This is a similar lighting setup to what we did for Vic here. Not exact, but similar. We tossed a chimera in front of Vic and gave him a little bit of that fill light action. We were okay with the sky blowing out here we could have spent more time and lit it better but we'd rather spend that time on a more mission critical scene we're hitting vic at 70 millimeters here because this will match reggie's coverage for reggie here we hit him at 70 millimeters to really knock that background just out of focus and crop out any distractions technically this scene is supposed to take place somewhere around high noon but we shot it at golden hour because it looks better as long as it looks good feels good nobody cares for the phone conversation we threw reggie frame left and we threw vic frame right that way when we cut between them they won't be on top of each other introducing zach now zach here is a mission critical character he's reggie's best friend, so we kind of want to give him that special treatment. Camera speed. Scene 22A, take one, marker, action. Hey man, you know that weird feedback we were getting the other day from the speakers? Uh, yeah, what about it? It's back. When we introduce him, we're gonna obscure his face and save the reveal for the end of the scene. We've got a lot of symmetry in the shot here, an equal amount of stuff weighing down both sides of the frame. We're foregrounding the mix rack here, out of focus, so that we can get some frame within a frame action happening. We can knock out two birds with one stone. We see Zach interacting with the mix rack, which is part of the story, but also we can focus on Zach's eyes back here and mask out the rest of his face to save his reveal for the end of the scene. We lit Zach back here to make sure he's the brightest thing in the frame, so your eyes, boom, go right to him. Overhead boom for all. Audio. And as far as the final reveal, we just did a simple tilt up as he stands. Mom's again. Huh, there's that window light again. You know, it's almost like we're staging scenes by windows for fast, easy, cheap lighting. Hmm, interesting. For the driving shots, I mounted a GoPro Hero 2 on the hood of my car. This is back when action cameras were still like a new thing. This scene is just here to help us compress time. We lead you to believe that Daryl Lynn is home alone because we just saw Reggie leave in the last scene. We're using all natural lighting for this scene. There's only one light, the sunlight coming through those blinds. We're at a 50 mil here, slightly telephoto so that we can foreground Daryl Lynn without revealing too much of her. You'll see her in the shot, but you won't really see her. That's the point. When she exits the room, we pan with her, but we never focus on her. When she lands in position two, we reveal Zach with a dirty over the shoulder shot. You thought she was alone, but she's not. The audience gets to put two and two together from prior scenes while we keep the story moving at lightning speed. And we still got to keep Daryl Lynn shrouded in mystery. For the SUMA meeting, we used a conference room in the film department at the U of A. We're using the Canon 18 to 135 kit lens for the scene. Now, I've got dark skin. Lighting is always a problem. We really had to pour on the bounce light here. We've got the blinds open on two windows just outside of frame. I got a B-board on either side of me pushing all kinds of bounce in my face. This is what final frame looked like. We didn't have to do any lighting on the reverse because she's got light skin and she's facing the windows. 
We have reached the point in the film where we really should show some of this erratic behavior from Daryl and at this point we've built up enough anticipation for it. However, in order to keep the tension going, we still can't show you everything. Not yet. So how do we shoot this scene with Daryl and without showing too much of Daryl and? Well, we used blocking and framing. As the scene plays out, we get a very frightening sense of just how far gone Daryl and is, but at no point in the scene do we show you her entire face. You get small glimpses of it, but that's it. We lock the frame down on Zach's perspective, but we just let Daryl and float in and out of frame. We went with a medium shot here so we can catch all of that beautiful body language from both actors. And for blocking, we had our obvious frame line here and we made sure she never dipped too far below. And uh, it worked, problem solved. We got to reveal more of why Daryl and needs help without losing tension. It is worth noting, we did 13 takes of this. If you want good performances, man, it takes time. To get the shot, this is where the actors were. This is where camera was. About a good 10 feet away on a 50 mil lens. For lighting, we got lucky. Uh, it was a bright sunny day. The scene takes place close enough to this window where all we had to do was just open the blinds. I must have ran across this courtyard like seven times. Full sprint to get this shot. I dig the framing, looks just like a picture. Very balanced composition, equally weighted on both sides. Again, you need a lot of lens compression to flatten things out like this. D is all the way across the courtyard on the Sigma 70 to 300, zoomed all the way in to 300. The conversation with Zach. We did shot reverse shot for most of it. We hit both gentlemen at 79 millimeters because we didn't want to see much of the background. It's plain, it's boring. By hitting these guys with a long lens, we can frame out a lot of the background and we can throw it out of focus. I mean, we're at 6.3 on Reggie and look at that background. Background. It's just a blurry mess. We want you to be focused on what these two gentlemen are talking about and not be distracted by things. So the framing on these gentlemen is also kind of tight. Again, because we don't want to see the background, we went with some dirty over the shoulder shots here because again, we don't want to see much of that background. Didn't use any lighting here. It was an overcast day. Everything was already very diffused. This side light action you see on Reggie here, that's actually just bounced light off the concrete. For the second part of the scene, we went with a wide two shot. The second these gentlemen changed the topic of discussion, we changed the framing. 50 mil lens here, nice and moody, no fill light. The focus of the shot here is this AC unit. And you're going to notice it for a few reasons. One, it's the only thing that's actually in focus. And two, the contrast, right? It's the darkest thing in the scene in relation to everything else. In this case, it attracts your eye because it's so dark. And number three, in the last scene, Zach had the last line. So more than likely you'll have been looking at him. So if we hard cut to this shot, your eye is still going to be on the left side of the frame. And the first thing you're going to notice is that AC unit. Reggie enters frame and boom, we got a reaction shot. Two birds with one stone. He's at 25 mil here, just wide enough to pull off this shot. This scene is all about aftermath, right? Like Reggie is noticing all of the things. We stay wide for the first part of this scene because Reggie guides your attention with his gaze. Wherever he looks, you're going to look, so there's no need for insert shots here. We're fairly confident you're gonna notice this little detail right here because Reggie stares right at it and has a reaction to it. To light the scene, we swap these incandescent bulbs here for 150 watt replacements. This is before the bulb swap, everything is dim, this is after. As you can see, things are a lot brighter, but we had massive problems matching color temperature. More on this later, but that was the key light. For Phil, we flew a mini mole around the back. 50 mil, 50 mil, 50 mil, bounce light for Phil. <laughs> 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 to pull this super low angle shot off, we threw the camera on a hi hat. In the tub there, that's the mini wall bouncing off the wall for Phil. The final reveal. This is the first moment we see Daryl without glasses, without obscuring her in some kind of way. We get a full clean close up. By this point, you've either noticed we've been deliberately holding her face back from you, or you haven't. In either case, you can feel a shift in tone take place here. Things start to get really serious from here on out. For lighting, we're just using bounce light from the concrete outside. You can see it in her eyes here. Daryl roughly on a third. We're leaving her plenty of look space to balance out the frame. We've got Reggie back here, roughly on a third. He's hitting this at 20 mils so that we can see Daryl but also Reggie over her shoulder. For the reverse here, classic head and shoulders two shot, central framing on that door in the back, both actors occupy roughly a third. This shot is Daryl perspective. Are these people friend or foe? We don't know. We're using 28 millimeters here because this approximates a normal field of view, as if you were actually here looking at these two people in front of you. I should add, this is still normal for an APS-C size sensor. The field of view isn't too wide, it isn't too narrow, it's right in the middle. And it's also wide enough for us to fit both of these actors in the frame. And for lighting, we got a guy with a bounce car just outside of frame, camera left. We're establishing a new scene from the inside out here. We're coming in on a small piece of action. Daryl shows the problematic AC, and then we pan into the scene. Boom, now we're in the scene. The focus of the shot here is this man's reaction. What does he think about all of the bizarre things he's hearing from Daryl? We're at 50 millimeters here. Classic head and shoulder shot framing for him. We went with 50 here because it's narrow enough to frame out the boring plainness of the walls here, but just wide enough where we can sneak in a dirty over the shoulder out of focus shot of Daryl. This was another opportunity for us to drip feed more of Daryl's bizarre behavior while still 
unmasking and obscuring her from you. We didn't bother shooting any coverage of Daryl in here because we knew we weren't going to use it. In fact, we got reaction shots of everyone else in the scene, but Daryl in. We shot an F2.8, a wide enough aperture to allow us to use the daylight coming through that window to light the scene. We're at 20 millimeters here, waist up two shot. We've got both actors on roughly a third for a nice balance frame. We kept their eyeballs at roughly the top third. This seems like a scene that deserves close ups, but we decided not to because the scene before we shot close ups and the scene right after this, we're shooting close ups. Yeah, it's a serious movie, but we can't shoot close ups in every scene. That gets really redundant. We figured, you know, the scene's short enough, we'll just stay wide. Establishing the scene on another small detail. In this case, a wicked mannequin eye. We put those eyes roughly on a top third, that right eye roughly in the upper right intersection. Now we're in a new scene. We went with the Tamron zoom here so we could open up to F2.8 and take advantage of all that available lighting. We're at 27 millimeters below eye line for a few reasons. One, we're wide enough to pull in some of the environment. We're confident the couch, the set, the composition, the production design can carry the shot. Two, we want to feature both the mannequin and Darylin in the shot. So we need to get low enough so we can get them both in the frame. And three, we want to obscure Darylin's face behind the mannequin. You already know the deal, bro, bro. Less is more, force of nature, blah, blah, blah. The only light we've got going on here is the sunlight coming through that window. That's it. That's why we're at a 2 -eight. For composition, Darylin and the mannequin occupy the center third, and they've got a third of breathing room on either side of them. So we're essentially center framed on Darylin and the mannequin. The AC unit and the AC intake are both centered on the left and right third to balance each other out, to make it like a picture. For the reverse shot here, we did a matching low angle to keep things consistent. For lighting, we're bouncing window light off a piece of foam core camera left. Camera right, we've got that front door open and we're hitting him from the other side with another bounce board. So he's getting double the bounce. My guy here is looking 3D. We're center framed on him. We put his eyes on the top third, booyah. By the way, we used boom sound for this entire scene. We're at 22 millimeters on a wide with these two here. We wanted to capture the vanishing point perspective. All of these leading lines point right to Lisa at the center of frame. And we also wanted to capture a little bit of that symmetry. As you can see, the left and the right side of frame mirror each other, just a little bit. This scene is one big primer for the following scene, which is the reveal of the petition to Daryl. Couple things we did with the framing to help visually communicate things. First off, we shot both actor close-ups at 28 millimeters, which is a little on the wider side of the normal range because we want you to feel closer to these characters in this moment, like you're right there with them. No Notice how much more of the environment you see over Lisa's shoulder here. It's like you're there with her, right? In Lisa's close up, we're slightly below eye level looking up to her. This is just Tuesday for her. She is an authority on these matters. The frame reflects that. By the way, we've got a bounce card camera left for Phil and we gave her plenty of look space. On the other hand, we can't say the same for Reggie. It's not every day that he files a petition on his mother. This is a fish out of water situation for him. He doesn't feel very powerful. And on top of that, he's not excited about what he has to do in the next scene. The frame reflects all of this. We're slightly looking down on him for moving power. We also have a bounce card camera, right? Giving him some of that 3D action here. And we left him plenty of look space. The petition reveal. Scenes like this can take forever to shoot if you're getting coverage on everyone. If you're on a crazy tight shooting schedule, rather than shoot everything, it's best to decide what coverage you're actually gonna use and then just shoot that. Damon had the brilliant idea of framing Reggie and the caseworkers in one frame and Daryl and isolated in another. This knocks out two birds with one stone. We can get in and out of the scene without shooting a ton of coverage. And we're also visually communicating that the social workers and Reggie are ganging up on Daryl. Or at least she feels that way. We're at 25 mil here so we can squeeze everyone in the shot. Both caseworkers sit on a third. Reggie's right in the middle. Nice balance shot. The key light for the the entire scene is the living room window here. The reverse on Daryl and also 25 millimeters here. We want the shots to match. It's also wide enough for us to see that her frame is looking kind of empty here. She doesn't have anybody else on her side. When things get intense, we punch into that close up at 50 mil. We're cropping everything else out. The only thing you need to be thinking about in this close up is Daryl. We're at 25 millimeters here on Lisa's reaction shot because we want to see Reggie over her shoulder. Even though it's her reaction shot, we want to remind you that Reggie is always there in the scene hearing everything. In terms of composition, Reggie takes a third, Lisa takes a third, the bathroom slaps look space takes a third. We put Lisa's eyes on the top there to give her headroom. For Reggie here, we're on 50 millimeters. Just backed up a bit. Reggie takes center third, the kitchen and the AC unit each occupy their own third to balance out the frame and put Reggie's eyes near the top third for headroom. As the scene progresses, we work in this really dirty over the shoulder shot of Daryl. We only use it when Daryl is addressing Reggie. We're connecting Daryl and Reggie in the same frame and we're excluding the case workers as if Daryl and Reggie are the only two in the room. At this moment, Daryl is not thinking about the case worker. She's only thinking about her son and the betrayal that she feels. And the frame reflects that. Lighting test, shot this at golden hour. Flex fill on an Apple box camera, right? Gold side up, bouncing that beautiful golden hour light on my black skin. And with that sunset lighting giving us a little over the shoulder kicker, Right there? I gotta say, Reggie, my man, you're looking real. 
3D. We're at 76 millimeters here. Little telephoto, so we can get that shallow depth of field. And if it knocked that background out of focus a little bit, so it's not as distracting. We actually shot this scene twice. The first time we shot it, we ran out of light. Quick note on Vic here. This character spends a lot of time in his office. In terms of wardrobe, we either want him to wear colors that match the colors of his office or complement them. The main colors of his office, gray and blue. So if you go through the film, the only clothing you will see him wearing is either gray or blue. I recorded all the home video footage with the Canon PowerShot Digital Elf. The audio you're hearing is from the actual camera. We're using a time lapse here to show the passage of time in a dynamic way. Inserting a time lapse here was also a good way to pick up the pacing of the film. There's only so much talking your audience can handle before they start to get bored. You gotta break that sh up. We can give you guys a break from all of the talking. You can vibe out to some music while we move the story forward. I was going for symmetry as usual here, placing the center of the window right in the middle of the frame. I framed up these palm trees here so they'd each be centered on their halves of the window. I was going for a frame within a frame here. Here's the metadata for the camera settings, all that jazz. I went through a lot of settings to pull the time lapse off. I hit the camera and tripod behind this window. Window seal. If you look close enough, you can see the actual tripod legs. If you freeze the frames during the time lapse, you can see me relighting the rooms as day changes to night. Because you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> the phone call with the police. The voice you hear on the other end of the line, the dispatcher, that was my girlfriend at the time. She was down to do some acting and she had a nice dispatcher voice. What can I say? As a general, you know, prerequisite, if I'm gonna get with you, you gotta be able to play a great police dispatcher. I'm all about it. But that's neither here nor there, is it? We hit this close up at 35 mil. Just wide enough for us to pull in some of this texture here. Good stuff. We've got a bounce board over here kicking in some fill light just outside of frame. Without the fill, this entire half of my face would be in complete darkness. For the wide shot, a couple things here. This whole shot's lit by one light. It's practical right here. However, we replaced the bulb. We took the 60 watt bulb out. We put a 150 watt bulb in. This shot here is yet another example of how we were constantly fighting against the limitations of the camera. My Canon 60D only has 10.5 stops of dynamic range, very limited. This is why this light bulb area is completely blown out. There is no detail in there. If this was shot with like a black magic pocket cinema camera, wouldn't be a problem, but those cameras didn't exist yet. Given the nature of the shot, bro, we can't fix this with lighting. So <laughs> we just embraced it. We went for the crazy noir high contrast. Just give us all of the contrast. And can we just take a moment to appreciate all of the beautiful textures you can see in that wall right there? Is that dope or is that dope? You're welcome. In order to capture this geometric boxy look here, we had to use a lot of lens compression. Damon was about 60 feet away at 135 mil on the kit lens. Darylin's in the kitchen doing her thing, cooking up Lord knows what. But I wanna point something out here. There's one light we never used in this film. This kitchen light right here. It's gross. The light's not bright enough and we get all kinds of banding. D taped a one by one LED panel to the ceiling to imitate the kitchen light. We can dim it down, dim it up, move it wherever we want. Just know that whenever you see this kitchen light on, it's fake. We're shooting everything in here on the Canon 18 to 135 kit lens. We got a small montage of Darylin making all the weird stuff. We're key lighting Darylin here with that one by one taped to the ceiling and we're supplementing it with another LED panel. We have two sources of light happening right here. We've got that LED panel on the far side key lighting her and then we've got somebody kicking in some bounce on the other side for Phil. And the one by one taped to the ceiling is giving us the ambient light. Yes, this is me dressed like Darylin, take it in. In order to get the GoPro underwater shot here, you know, I, I kind of had to shoot it on a pickup day. All right, got it. Just because you want to, because you're a rebel. Jet, just clap it afterwards. Maybe we'll get something. So maybe you're asking yourself, hey, why do I hear kids? Be or not, my friend, I have an answer for you. In order to get all this depth in the shot that you see back here, Damon had to shoot me through my bedroom window. Yes, that's what you saw. It was a window screen. And for lighting, we bounced a mini mall off the far wall. <laughs> Sleeping by the front door. We bring you into the scene with the shot of a door. The focus of the shot, the doorknob and the catch lock. We went with the 20 mil for a couple of reasons. The doorknob and the catch lock are slightly distorted as they are closer to camera and we're zoomed out to 20 mil. They're a little bigger than they should be and this cartoonish distortion makes things feel a little weird. And that's the vibe we're going for. Reason number two, this shot also serves as a reveal. We see shadows moving about to the left of frame here, right? And we hear the sound of something heavy shuffling about. For that brief moment, the audience gets to wonder, what in the heck is going on here? And then boom, the chair hits the door, mystery solved. Small calculated reveal shots like this go a long way in keeping your audience guessing and by extension, keeping them engaged. The chair shot here, 50 millimeters at f4. For the key light here, we used a mini model on a pigeon. This is just a recreation here. This light was imitating a lamp on the floor. This is thereabouts where we set up the key light like it was clear across the room. We're using bottom lighting here to channel some of that horror film energy. Reggie's going through his own little personal nightmare here. He's not having fun and the lighting reflects that. We had Tornay do some lens and light wipes. 
meaning we had her walk in front of camera and in front of the light. By having Tornay wipe the lens, moving about the house, she's casting her shadow all over Reggie by walking in front of that light. These are the same lens and light wiping techniques you'd see in a horror film, we're just applying them to a drama. Because again, we have to keep the tension going. If we lose the tension, we lose the audience. Second time lapse to pick up the pace, keep things moving. Fun fact, I blew this time lapse four times. I pulled an all nighter four nights in a row before I got a usable time lapse. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. We shot this entire scene here through the doorway to create more depth, make this apartment feel a little bigger than it is. We're also silhouetting Reggie against these window blinds here. We're zoomed into about 100 millimeters to get this framing. We are smashing him up against that window with lens compression to give you an idea of how far away camera was. He's in the living room, right about here. Marker. The kitchen showdown. We did a lot of prep for this shot. This is one of the three times I had to completely trash my apartment. This doorway here is dividing the frame up into three equal thirds for us. We've got a vanishing point working for us, giving us leading lines pointing to the center of the frame where all the actions take place. This is the most production design intensive wide shot of any shot in this entire film. We're zoomed all the way out to 17 millimeters to get all of it. So maybe she backs up here and then sees it and picks it up like that. Or it could be maybe in front of the microwave. Okay, go. This is our lighting scheme for the whole scene. For the key light, we have a Chimera softbox imitating window light. This guy right here. Setting up a fill was a bit more tricky scene as we're doing this in a wide shot because Damon's gonna be right here, all the way backed Ew. up against the wall. We wound up throwing a mini mole here with a grip clamp. We aimed the light right at the wall, giving us a nice soft bounce. Gaffer clamp clamped to the top of the cabinet, mini mole attached, bouncing off the kitchen wall. This is a gaffer clamp. You can attach lights to it with this baby pin here. This is a gaffer clamp with a mini mole light attached. And this was our setup. A mini mole light clamped to the top of the cabinet, blasting into the kitchen wall. All kinds of bounce light. This is the chimera here, our key light. And this is the bounced fill light. You can see the bounce in my eyes right here. Booyah. But here's the best part, bro. We've got shadow fall right in the middle of the faces. Are we lighting for emotion or are we lighting for emotion? This lighting setup takes care of both the wide shot and the close-ups. For the reverse on Tornay, we move the chimera further into the room. See, this looks like window light hitting her right here, but that can't be the window light hitting her from the side because the window's behind her. So where is this light coming from? As long as the light's coming from the same general direction as the motivated lighting source, your audience isn't gonna notice. We cheated the light all the way to this door here. This is the light stand. We moved the light right there. <laughs> There's no window there, bro. You'd never guess we moved the lights around this much. Your lighting does not have to be perfect. As long as it looks good, feels good, nobody cares. For audio, we boom mic this bad boy. And we hit a backup wireless lav here. Everybody settle. And action. The police prep. We want a fast paced baby montage here to ramp up the energy leading us into the next scene. We're going for tight close ups here, easy to light, easy to shoot. For most of these shots, we flew in a chimera overhead as a key light. Top down, nice reflection off the foil there, hanging just outside of frame top down here, just using window light here. It's directly above me in this shot, handheld on camera as we look in the bag. Yeah. That's how we got it. <laughs> There's that overhead Kaimi imitating the kitchen light. Remember, every time you see this light on, it's fake. All right, we can cut. Extraction by force. Top of the scene, we have an empty shot. We let the cops walk into frame as they're assessing the situation. We stay with the police officers as they enter the residence because for this brief moment, they are a surrogate audience. They are outsiders thrust into the madness of the situation, just like our audience. So we're naturally gonna be curious as to what these guys are thinking about what they're seeing. We wanna capture that moment. That's why we stayed on the cops. At position two, they settle into a two shot. We went with 50 millimeters for the two shot of the cops here because it's a little telephoto for us. We're isolating the cops in the frame. When they're in the frame, we don't want you looking at anything else. I mean, it's the cops. In position two, the officers are falling on the left and right third, replacing their eyes on the top third. On the reverse shot of Reggie here, we went with a 25 mil to leave room for the cops to crowd Reggie's frame. They're here to take care of business. They have the authority, they have the muscle, and they are dominating the situation just like they are dominating the frame. That open door is taking care of all of our lighting for us. Camera. Do you want me to tap it? I'll Speed. Be, I'll... 114B, take one, marker. All right, CJ, wiggle your boom. You're good. Right there is good. Got it. 114A, take two, marker. Oh, made me laugh. <laughs> Wesley's nice face. As Reggie watches the proceedings here, we have this profile close-up, very dramatic lighting here. The light looks like it's coming from this window, but it's not. The window light's not strong enough to reach Reggie. And remember, I've got dark skin. <laughs> My skin absorbs light like a black hole. We added our own light just outside of frame 
to imitate the window light. We threw the grid on to tighten up the beam angle. This Chimera is giving him a soft far side key and also giving him some separation so he doesn't blend into the background. If we take a look at false color, we can see just how much underexposed beautifulness we have here. I didn't drop the shadows in post. This is how we shot it. Same here, we want it dark and moody, no fill light. For lighting, we bounce sunlight off of a B board through the living room window. This is a piece of leaf filter quarter grid cloth gaff taped to the window. We're diffusing the bounce light with this cloth, thereby turning the window into a giant softbox. With this setup, we're able to punch more light into that living room. By the way, this angle here is from Reggie's perspective. We see what he sees. We're at 28 millimeters here to pull more of the environment into the shot because this is what Reggie would be seeing. But also we want to remind you of how trash this place is. The reverse shot is from the cop's perspective. Again, these people are across the room from each other. But at 25 millimeters here, it also gives us an opportunity to pull that environment into the shot. This place is destroyed, bro, bro. We used the same bounce light window setup. We just moved the bounce to the other side. The forced removal scene. I'm gonna be real with y'all. We didn't have the time, the budget, or the energy to orchestrate an actual police removal scene. There are safety concerns. We don't have a stunt double. We can't afford to lose our main actor. So yeah, no, out of the question. But even if we had all of the resources to shoot an actual police removal, we still wouldn't have done it because that's not honest to how these things happen. The reality is the way we shot it is how it actually happens. You don't get to watch. We wanted to capture the truth of this experience as honestly as possible. So we're covering the entire thing from Reggie's perspective in one shot, real time. No cuts, we want it to feel as real as possible. We don't show you anything that Reggie wouldn't have been able to see from the confines of his room. He can only see a limited view of the cop, you can only see a limited view of the cop, but he can hear everything. We knew going into this, sound design's gonna play a big role. We're hitting the whole thing at 50 mil, which is a little telephoto, but we're shooting through a doorway. And we also wanna be able to foreground the police officers. <laughs> For Zach's apartment, we use Damon and Christina's place as a location. All right, ready? <laughs> Roscoe's chicken and waffles. Yeah, Z, it's Reg. Hey man, what's up? You busy? For lighting here, bouncing sunlight off of a B-board through the quarter grid cloth on the window to get that nice, soft, sunny punch into the room. I got it, drove it. We stay tight on Reggie in this scene while he's photographing the damages. We're not really showing you the destroyed house here because less is more. We get it already. It's more about his reaction to what he's seeing. Again, that chimera light is imitating the overhead fluorescence of the kitchen here. And action! Holy. Hold on, bruh, bruh. We gotta get at some of these bills. Before we go any further, a big thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Their support helped make it possible for me to bring you content like this, fam. Surfshark is a VPN service that makes online security very simple. Like one click simple. Surfshark encrypts all internet traffic sent to and from your devices so that your IP address remains hidden. Nobody can see what you do online. On top of that, they block ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts. And unlike other VPN services, you can use it on as many devices as you'd like simultaneously. I spend a lot of time online, so securing my info is a pretty big deal to me, bro, bro. I've had a few accounts get hacked in the past, not fun. So I use Surfshark to encrypt my personal info so that this does not happen again. Side note, you can use it to access movies and TV shows that might be blocked in your country. Take Netflix, for example. Shows like Archer and Rick and Morty aren't streamable on Netflix in the US. But if you fire up Surfshark and connect to another server in say Mexico, boom, now you can stream these shows on Netflix. Basically, you can choose any country to stream from without actually being there. Bounce. Here's the deal, fam. If you click the link in the description section and you use coupon code D4Darius, you'll get 83% off and you'll also get three extra months free. Booyah. Get your internet security and streaming game up, bruh. Back to the video. Love the framing here, shooting through doorways once again for depth. This closet wall here is dividing the frame directly in half. We've got a lot of symmetry going on on the left and right side of frame. Here we took another opportunity to lead with mystery. We can hear someone fumbling around in the kitchen off screen. And it's not Reggie, because we can see Reggie. So who is it? For that brief moment, we have you asking questions. And then boom, the office manager rises into frame. That's who is making the noise. It's fun to find interesting ways to introduce your characters and it's engaging for your audience. With blocking and staging, we put each of these guys on a third, giving us a balanced frame. The eyes fall roughly on the top third. Everyone has look space. We really tried to stack the frame here to get as many layers going as possible. First layer, we've got the office manager. Second layer, we've got Reggie in the kitchen wall. Third layer, we've got the closet space. And the fourth layer, we've got that front door all on four separate planes, really giving us that depth. This is probably the worst scene in the movie, both Damon 
and I hate it from a lighting standpoint. Remember, we swapped the practical bulbs with 150 watt bulbs. We couldn't get the color temperatures to match. The living room's one color, the bathroom's another. This is what lighting with cheap bulbs gets you. Nowadays, plenty of inexpensive lighting solutions for situations like this, but that was then, this is now. We're telephoto at 67 millimeters here because we want to compress the distance between Reggie and the office manager. They're a good five to seven feet apart, but they almost look like they're the same size in the frame. That's the lens compression. Visually, we want to communicate that Reggie is just on top of this guy. Here we have foregrounded Reggie. Not only does he serve as a depth cue, but we made sure to include Reggie in every shot with the office manager because he wants to find out if he's gonna get evicted. So he's watching the guy like a hawk. We're at 17 millimeters here. This room is tiny and we had to go wide to get Reggie in the shot. Only way to get him in there. Also, Damon's bringing me up with a little fill light camera left with a chimera. Without that light, I would be a straight up silhouette. Fun fact, my script made a cameo in the film. It's right here. I tried to remove it and post, couldn't do it. Part of the challenge with shooting in small locations is it's easy to shoot them out. If you repeat too many shots from the same angles, it makes the location feel even smaller. The only way to avoid it is to just keep mixing it up. Keep coming at scenes with fresh new angles. For the eviction notice scene, we shot profile toward the windows. We haven't done that yet. We hit both actors at 42 millimeters here, slightly telephoto for an APS-C sensor. We want to push both those actors up against that back wall and just flatten things out. Here's the deal. These two are not on the same page. They don't see eye to eye. One might be evicting the other. By shooting these guys in profile, facing each other like a showdown, we can communicate these things visually. For lighting, we tossed a one by one LED panel just outside of frame to imitate window light. We did this for both actors. We didn't use any fill light here. We want the high contrast. We want the moodiness. Here's that shot with no lighting. Same shot with lighting. Big difference. Access Tucson. This place doesn't exist anymore, but back in the day when I was in film school, I did a summer internship here 10 years ago. We're using this location as a backdrop for all intents and purposes. Reggie and Zach work here. We want to establish this new location, but we don't want to do it all in one shot. We want to beat around the bush, make it interesting. This shot here, intentionally out of focus, just to get you asking questions. Where are we? What are we looking at? And then we rack that focus in. Boom. We're in some kind of studio somewhere. I see lights, but we're framing things here in sort of an abstract way to keep you guessing. These are not balanced shots. We're not abiding by the rule of thirds here. The whole point is to keep it abstract. This shot here, again, we have a hand out of focus in some sort of control desk. We're giving you guys little breadcrumbs, little insert shots here and there of small details, and we let you put the pieces together to figure out where we are. That's our boom operator's cameo there. This place needs to look like it's popping with action, right? But we don't have any extras. So we just took turns wiping the lens to make this place seem like it's bigger than it is. That's our DP right there. And that's me doing a lens wipe. There's Damon's first cameo as Chad, and that's me doing a lens wipe. You want me talking about this? Just casually. Nothing forced. If you happen to say something to him, great, but. We're hitting Zach here at 135 millimeters on the kit lens because we're using lens compression to magnify this monitor, blow it up, make it bigger, so that we can get this half seas shot of Zach on one end of the screen and the monitor on the other. The control room. This is how it looks before lighting. This this is not gonna work. We definitely need to light this. We threw in two one by one LED panels to light the scene. Does it make sense to have bottom lighting in a control room? Pfft, no. As you can see, there's no logical reason why there would be lights there. But we're bottom lighting it because we're making a movie and we need the scene to have a certain vibe. As long as it looks good, feels good, nobody cares, bro. And this is the final result. Marker. You're not in it. He's not oh, in it. He's just gonna right. see your hands. That's okay. all he's gonna see. Yeah. All right. We're slightly telephoto at 50 millimeters here because we want to magnify those televisions. We want them large and in charge so you get a sense of his workspace. That bottom lighting just looks dope, doesn't it? That's a vibe. Killing it, D. Why, thank you. You see those catch lights in my eyes? That's why we wanted bottom lighting. You can see the two LED panels in my eyeballs. <laughs> and given the context of the scene, Reggie's almost losing his job. That lighting really helps to tell that story. Not even seeing any acting, just looking at a frame. I look sad. I look like a kick puppy. I'm not sad at all. That's just the lighting. That's why lighting so important. A beautiful job lighting here, considering we didn't have much to work with. Oh, and checkerboard lighting. Shadow, light, shadow, light. For the reverse here, her key light is the studio lights in the adjacent room. They're really bright. We've got a Camara soft box in the hallway, giving her a little over the shoulder kicker light action. 
the passion project. This scene here, we shot dual cam, two Canon 60Ds. We shot everything day for night, blacked out the windows with garbage bags. We supplemented the kitchen lighting with four additional LED panels. This light here was for Zach, but these three lights here were to bring me up. Remember, I've got dark skin. <laughs> absorbs a lot of light. We're hitting me at 50 millimeters here, slightly telephoto. Between the lighting and the out-of-focus background, Reggie's really popping out here. We took the wide shot at 35 millimeters, normal field of view. We got a frame within a frame action happening. For the audio, we set a boom mic just outside of frame to capture both of us in the two shot. The first hospital scene. First off, we did not film this in a hospital. This was one of our many reshoots. We could not secure the hospital location we had because it doesn't exist anymore. So we had to recreate it. We hit this close up at 20 mils, a little on the wider side because we want you to feel closer to Darylin. The key light over here is from a window and Damon is Hollywooding an LED panel for film. We shot this at our makeup artist's house. He had a spare room with tile flooring. Perfect, we cheated the entire thing. All right, this is pill take one. Pill time. Just put them on the table. I'll take them later. We have to watch you take it. Well, well thank you for the lovely rest. <laughs> We shot Vic at Campus Health. We were able to secure another office very close by to shoot the Dr. Daniels scene. The scene with Dr. Daniels. We have the usual challenges with shooting actors up against windows here. First off, we lucked out super hard that it was an overcast day. Had it not been for that, we would have had to change the way we shot this. Even with the overcast helping us out, we still had the problem of managing the dynamic range. The difference between the lights and the darks is still too broad for the camera. For example, here, we're exposed for Reggie. We're at F4. Reggie looks great. The sky looks terrible. It's all blown out. Here, we're exposed for the sky. The sky looks great. Now Reggie looks terrible. If we're going to have the windows in the shot, we're gonna have to add some light because there's just too much contrast for the camera to handle. For all of Dr. Daniel's coverage, we used a Chimera camera left for some fill. We brought him up with the light so when we expose for the sky, he's not a silhouette. For Reggie's coverage, we didn't even include the window in the shot. Look better without it. For the wide shot, here is the shot with no fill light applied. Faces are very dark. And here is that same wide shot with a Chimera camera left. It's just barely bringing us up enough so that we can expose for that window and we can still see the actors. Top of the scene, we cover Dr. Daniels at 20 mils. So we can catch both his reaction and the business with the handy cam all in the same frame. The rest of the scene is just shot, reverse shot, both at 50 mil. All right, think fast. Did you have a Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Since RD is going to be on camera recording people as a filmmaker, he's got to look like he knows what he's doing with the gear, right? So D and I gave him a crash course on filmmaking. Try to be like, use fingertips wow, here. That's really <laughs> While RD and I interviewed people for the fake movie, Damien recorded us interviewing people for the real movie. Here's the game plan, okay? We want the Volkswagen montage section of the movie to feel vibrant and alive. These guys are on the move here. They're following their passions. The camera should echo this. These shots should be dynamic, lots of movement. This segment should look and feel different from the rest of the film. We went with the Glycam 4000 for this, primarily. For the interviews, we took a docu-style approach. Damon shot us with long lenses. The idea was to keep Damon out of sight, out of mind. You wouldn't even know he was there. Meanwhile, he zoomed in like at 135 millimeters or something, recording us doing our thing. When people notice, man, they're looking at us a little confused. Like, why is this guy filming you while you're filming us? <laughs> When I say telephoto, I mean telephoto. This is Damon right here, catching us at 135. He was pretty much a sniper with a camera. For the B-roll of the cars, Damon and I fell back on a GoPro Hero 2 with an extension and my Canon 60D on the Glycam HD 4000. Again, dynamic, energy, movement, action. We shot out a car show at Churco Automotive. And then we took a little trip to Phoenix, Arizona. And we shot out Buggerama. That's where we got all the drag racing footage. Mind you, all of this is over the span of months. We did this during pickups. And then we shot out one more show in Tucson for good measure. In addition to shooting out car shows, we also shot out the three main Volkswagen cruises in Tucson. In the span of two months, we recorded over 82.6 gigabytes worth of footage from four different cameras and over five hours and 30 minutes worth of footage. And we only used a minute and 41 seconds of all of that in the final movie. When it comes to doc style shooting, it's like fishing. We had to shoot that five plus hours worth of footage to get that one minute, 40 seconds of gold. Back at Zach's house, establishing a new scene on a small detail. Shot with a 50 mil. This scene here where Zach and Reggie make plans to interview Reggie, this is sort of a transitional scene. Mm. Trent says he's free for the cruise. The whole day? 
I wanted to add a little blocking to liven things up because there's just a lot of sitting and standing going on in this movie so far. So we shot this scene in a way to allow for that. Damon sent us at 32 millimeters here, just wide enough for him to frame both of us up in the shot. Since RD is the focus of the shot, we're gonna keep him foregrounded in focus while we're gonna keep me, you know, slightly out of focus in the background. We've got a few different lights going on here. We've got two lights on RD and there's a whole bunch of lights in the kitchen. These are all the lights in the kitchen. We left them from a previous setup. We've got two LED panels, camera left, imitating a desk lamp. Here those two little puppies are right here. That's giving us our soft key here. And we've got a one by one LED panel camera right filling in the broad side of his face. Without Phil, his face would be really dark. We don't want that much drama. You can see the shadow of the fill out on the wall here, but you know, there's shadows in life, guys. When Reggie enters the room, we jump in the classic shot reverse shot. Take three. Zach's far side key, the same LED panel. Zach's fill, same one by one LED panel, camera right. We also got a little catch light city happening in those eyes there. For the reverse, we're using the same setup, same key light. And for a kicker, we got a one by one over his shoulder. We shot this whole scene day for night. We've blacked out this window with trash bags and these production design elements back here. They're shooting a Volkswagen movie, that's why they got the map back there. And the cat over Reggie's shoulder. We dropped about $400 blowing up pictures of Damon's cat and putting them all over the house. We thought it'd be funny if Zach was one of those cat people that just had like pictures of his cat everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, it's a dramatic film, but that doesn't mean we can't have a little fun with it. You know what I mean? Yummy. For the wide shot, we got the exact same setup, guys. LED panel against that wall. One by one for Phil. We shot Reggie's interview at a place called uh, Gates Pass. So this place looks amazing at Golden Hour. We shot this piece like a documentary because that's what they're making. Used a dual camera setup here, shot a ton of B-roll of Reggie with the car. You explain one thing to me? Mm -hmm. Why is cut face in your car? We need a little context here. In addition to his duties as first AC, Jack also makes an appearance in this film as a character we call Cutface. Uh, uh. Camera sex. Relax guys, they're just kit lenses. Camera's Speed. rolling. 70, 72 BNC. Take 12. Take 12. We shot the final interview out until we ran out of light. 12 takes, Canon 18 to 135 kit lens on both cameras for the close up 45 mil and for the medium zoomed out to 35 mil. The point of the medium shot here, you get more of a sense of the space, you get to see the environment around Reggie and we need something to cut away to. We picked the spot because we could frame up Tucson over Reggie's shoulder here. Same for the close up, no metaphoric meaning, it just, it just looked pretty. We lucked out crazy hard to get this hospital location. I already talked about it in the documentary, not getting into it here. We're wide here because we want to establish the front lobby space. This is the first time you're seeing it. We also want to establish the front desk lady here because she and this space are going to play a bigger role later in the film. It's a short little scene, but again, the main purpose of this scene is set up. Remember that no money for locations thing? <laughs> yeah, we couldn't shoot the hospital visit at a real hospital, so we faked it. We shot all of the hospital visitation scenes at Pima Community College. All right, there. If you notice, there's never actually an establishing shot of the hospitals themselves. By the way, there's cut face. Every scene we have in a hospital, we establish it from the inside out. This is the only reason why this shot is here of the guy with the cut on his face. We start off on a little detail, then we pull out into the scene. Marker. Camera A. Marker. I'll call action, just don't look at me. Oh, uh, you're all level one. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna call action, but you're staring at me, so. I'm gonna call action, that's fine. Well, I can call action, because you're on camera. We start the scene off in a medium wide-ish two shot. The idea is to capture all the small talk and all the chit chat in the medium wide. Once we're done with the small talk and we see some real connection happening, that's when we move in for those close ups. It's a clear way to visually differentiate the beats of the scene. We decided to shoot all of the coverage over the shoulder, no clean singles, because we want to see these two characters together, connecting, sharing the frame. Now we hit Reggie here at 285 millimeters on the Sigma zoom because we just wanted to obliterate the background. We're obviously not shooting at a real hospital, it's a community college doubling as a hospital. We don't have complete control over this location and there's a lot of stuff back there we don't want you to see, so we're just gonna blur it out. We shot all of Zach and Reggie's edit based scenes and meetups at the University of Arizona Film Department, our old film school.
we jump you into a new scene by starting in on a small detail, in this case it's the map, and then boom, you're in the scene. We want to light this scene so it looks like it's taking place late afternoon-ish time frame. Evening lighting is so pretty. For the key light, we threw up a 2K Mole Richardson. It's imitating sunlight coming through a back window. It's a tungsten light, so we threw a quarter CTB on there to cool it down. You know, blew it up. We dropped it down so it hits us at an angle, kind of like those late afternoon vibes. The funny thing about the bounced light in this scene is it looks like it's coming from the map on the table, but it's not. I'd say 90% of the fill light you see hitting us on the broad side is coming from a bounce card. For bounce, we set up a B-board on a C-stand, rigged it up with a platypus. As you can see, that bounce is doing quite a bit. This is without the bounce card. This is with the bounce card. We were running crew minimal. We did not have two bounce card setups, which is why we shot this scene single camera. When we finished shooting coverage for Reggie, we moved the setup over to Zach. Boom. For the wide shot, we used the same bounce card setup. We just moved it a little further back. We were able to get both actors. Damon played Chad. Practically everyone in our crew appears somewhere in this movie. We framed Chad up on a third here and left him plenty of look space to balance out the other half of the frame. At 20 millimeters here, covering Zach and Reggie in a medium two shot because these guys are a team. They think together, they plan together. As they're negotiating with Chad, we can see that shorthand where they, it's like they can read each other's minds. By hitting this with a two shot, we can capture that dynamic. The audience gets to bounce back and forth between their reactions real time all in the same frame. We put each of these gentlemen on a third for a nice balanced frame, and we also left them both some headroom. Establishing a new scene on a small detail. We covered this scene in a wide for a few reasons. One, we want to mix it up because we've got a lot of close-ups going on. Two, the composition holds up. It's a dope frame. And three, so much of the scene is communicated in the blocking here. It's about that body language. We want to see all of that. Let's look at the composition. There's a lot going on here. It's a well-populated frame, but what makes it work are the leading lines. Everything about this framing is designed to guide your eye to Reggie. Reggie occupies roughly a third. The middle of the car occupies roughly a third. We're not dead on in terms of thirds here, but the frame still feels balanced. For lighting, we've got a bounce card on a C-stand just outside of frame, camera left, giving me a little bit of that fill action so I'm not a complete shadow. Back at Vic's office, we threw Vic on the left third because in the prior shot, your eye would have been here. So coming into this shot, you'll already be looking where we want you to look. It makes for a nice cut. Left them plenty of headroom and look space. And if that wasn't enough, we used production design and perspective to create as many leading lines as possible so the entire frame flows to Vic. And he also inhabits the brightest part of the frame. If you are not looking at this man, you're not watching the movie. We're recording a phone conversation here, so we already got Vic on the left third. That means we need to put Reggie on the right third. So when we cut between these two guys, they're not on top of each other. We film Reggie in the car under shade here because it looks better, but we threw in some of that fill light action. Bounce car camera right for Phil. You would think there's plenty of light in a clinic, and you'd be right. But there's light everywhere. We still gotta fly some light in there to get some modeling on the face. Take this shot for instance. Lighting looks very, uh, blah. Let's light it. Flew in a one by one LED panel camera right, and another panel right over his shoulder giving him some rim. Now we got some we got some 3D action happening. That's how we lit this shot right here. In this scene here, we shot these two guys in uncomfortably tight over the shoulder close-ups. We even hit it on a 50 mil lens, a little telephoto action to make it even more claustrophobic. Visually, we want to communicate that these two guys are crowding in on each other's space. I mean, in the scene, they're stepping on each other's toes. So, the confrontation. We had a dual camera set up here, one for Vic, one for Darylin. We went with zoom lenses so that we wouldn't impose on the actors. We can capture the action without getting in the actor's face. For lighting, we placed an LED panel just outside of both frames. I gave discrete direction to one actor at a time. Sometimes these simple scenes are the hardest to direct because it's really all about that nuance. Going in for close-ups, we adjusted the lighting and we just placed the lavaliers on top of the clothing for optimal sound. You're not going to see the labs anyway. You can see the LED panel we used in Tornay's eyes here. It made for a nice catch light. We zoomed all the way into 135 on the Canon kit lens to annihilate the background. However, we gave Vic the Sigma and we zoomed all the way into 285 millimeters for his close-up because in terms of dramatic action, he has a... Uh, very interesting moment here. Says some interesting things. We want to make sure when he says those interesting things, you're only looking at him. At 285 millimeters, there is nothing else to look at. That background is obliterated. It is a milky mess. We nuked that freaking background. And when Vic says this, I am on your side here. This is his attempt at regaining Darylin's trust. We changed the framing on him to reflect that. We literally put him on Darylin's side of the frame. But the real question here, does Darylin feel the same way? Hmm. Visually speaking, she does not. She sticks to her side of the frame and keeps her distance. Went to a real Volkswagen cruise to get these shots here.
shot this on a GoPro Hero 2. Establishing shot on a small detail. D's at 18 mil here, nice and wide, almost cartoonish. It's funny because this is the camera we're shooting 80% of this movie with, and they're using the same camera to shoot their fictional movie. A little meta if you think about it. Using a polarizer filter to bring out the blue in the sky. D's at 106 mil here, using lens compression to magnify all those beautiful details in the background there. We're using a polarizer here to knock down the highlights on my forehead. That's why it doesn't look natural. For those who don't know, we use polarizers to cut down on glare so we can see through windshields, water, etc. My skin looks powdery though, like clay. This is what my skin is supposed to look like. As you can see, quite a difference. Generally, we don't use polarizers to knock down highlights on skin. Kinda not what they're designed for, but this is an indie film with a tiny budget. So we just gotta do what we gotta do. Classic shot, reverse shot for the phone call. We just shot Vic in front of Pima West. It looks kinda like a hospital, so eh. This shot here is a visual metaphor for Reggie giving up his dreams to go and deal with his mother. It's an easy effect. Got footage of the camera in place, pulled the camera out. Got footage of a clean plate with no camera, faded between the two in post, boom. Also, we're using a polarizer to bring out the blue in the sky there. So we're leaving this scene with a lot of energy and we want to carry that energy forward into the next scene. So when Reggie explodes into the hospital, we figure using a gimbal shot would be a nice dynamic way to keep that energy going. Speed, got it, thank you. Like two or three, yeah. We're at 85 millimeters here on Reggie. Pretty telephoto, cause we're not trying to see a whole lot of that background. Not much going on back there. We're below eye level, looking up at Reggie because we want to open up his face to camera. Since he's looking down at her, we gotta get a little lower. We got an LED panel for a key camera, right? That's the same light that's giving me these beautiful catch lights here. Got a second LED light just over my shoulder, giving me a little bit of this action right here. On the reverse, we're hitting her at 85 to match Reggie's coverage. Now she's looking up at Reggie, so we need to look down on her, kinda, just a little bit, slightly above eye level to open up her face to camera. We are diminishing her power with this framing, but you know, it kind of works for the scene because she's getting barked at by Reggie. So kind of a two for one. We're key lighting her with the same one by one LED panel, giving us some modeling on the face. But also more importantly, we got a little catch light city going on in those eyes there. We can see so much emotion in those beautiful little crystal balls. We're at 135 here, very telephoto. We're framing out the boring parts of this lobby here and magnifying the parts that we want to see this stuff back here. And we are key lighting her with the same panel. So this shot here is obviously very heavily tinted. This is not by design. We were not going for this. <laughs> On the day, we didn't have an indie filter, ran to Best Buy, bought a cheap indie filter, and uh, we got this. This color cast here, uh, not not loving it. There was all this extra blue and magenta in the skin tones. I could not color correct this out. And this is more what skin tones should look like on a vector scope. See how we got a nice healthy amount of red? Yeah, <laughs> pretty big difference. Just as a point of reference, here's another image without that filter. This is what skin tones are supposed to look like. No, I'm not gonna name the brand of the filter, but you can probably guess. I am not here to throw shade. I'll just say this you get what you pay for. I mean, it, it doesn't look terrible, but if you wanna apply a heavy color grade to your footage, that should be something you're doing intentionally. You don't want filters that give your footage color casts. We're using the ND here so we can open up by a couple more stops to throw that background even more out of focus. We pulled off a wide shot at 50 mil here to give you a better sense of the space going any wider and you would have seen parts of this lobby we don't want you to see. We communicate a lot of information in this shot. We can see Reggie still waiting over here, but we guide your eye to the front desk worker with all these leading lines. She's in the hot seat right now. She's stuck between a rock and a hard spot, right? So we made sure she's always the focus of the shot. We keep her in the center of frame. She makes her calls, center of frame. As she works her way out to speak with Reggie, still the center of frame in the hot seat. We even added a vignette in post to make sure the center of frame is always the brightest part of the frame. So your eye is always drawn to her. This poor woman, <laughs> this is just not her day. Poo, take one. Love this mirror shot, D's at around 20 mil here. For lighting here, we're just using house lights. In terms of visual metaphors, this is the scene where we start to see another side of Reggie that's not so admirable. So we thought it would be appropriate to capture that duality with the reflection in the mirror. Metaphors aside, shooting off the mirror here is just another interesting way to cover a bathroom scene. 50 mil low angle shot here on Zach. We went low, cause we want to capture a little bit of that aggression. Zach's not happy with Reggie right now. And for good reason too. So we want to give him some authority with his framing. This was one of our pickup shots. I had to shoot this scene at broad daylight because we're filming a cruise. Had it not been for that, I would have shot this at magic hour. Shooting in broad daylight sucks for lighting, bruh bruh but we gotta make it work. So I put the sun behind him to backlight him and then we filled him in with some bounce. We're at F11 at 50 millimeters. I'm able to blur these trees out back here, but we get some nice background texture in the frame without it being distracting. 
Here's the deal, fam. In order to get the next shot you're about to see, we had to catch a real Volkswagen cruise. We're located right about here. We want to catch a shot of the entire cruise driving by Zach, which means we only get one shot at this. And we got it. We pulled it off. Talk about stress. Like, I had one shot. If I miss the marker, foul up the shot somehow, it's another three month wait for a cruise. I'm at 135 millimeters on the kit lens here. I want to compress the image so that RD and the cars are about the same size so that you can clearly see that the Volkswagens are passing him by and he's missing the cruise. True story, a sheriff is approaching our actor and he's literally just outside of frame. We staged a broken down car on the side of the road for the movie, but then a sheriff showed up to offer us a hand because uh, he didn't know we were filming. Had he come 60 seconds earlier, he would have ruined the shot. And uh, yeah, enough said. Yeah. I won't touch the camera. It's already recording. No, it isn't. It it's not recording. That's why you're smiling. <laughs> no, because you're smiling. Using the LED panel here for a little film. I don't know what I was thinking about here. Probably ice cream. That light's also giving us some catch light city action. Good stuff. And we're at 85 to crop out what we don't want to see. For the final confrontation between the front desk lady and Reggie, we cover them both below eye level, giving them both positions of authority as far as framing is concerned. Reggie is standing his ground. He's not leaving until he sees the doctor. And the front desk lady insists that he leave or she's gonna have to call the cops. Both have an equal amount of resolve on the scene, hence the framing for authority. For the front desk lady, we hit her at 85 to match Reggie's coverage. One by one LED panel camera right for key light, also giving us a little catch light city. We gave both characters dirty close-ups because these two people are having a showdown. Who's gonna give up first? She's just trying to do a good job. Reggie's standing in her way. Visually, he is imposing on her frame. Reggie's gotta see the doctor, but he's gotta go through her first. She's standing in his way, just like she is standing in his frame. This is outside of a real hospital. It's not the same hospital, but it is a real working hospital. We had to steal this shot. Hashtag guerrilla filmmaking. We're only 85 mil prime here, so we can open up to F1.8. We can't set up any lights because we're stealing this shot, so we need a really fast lens to gobble up some light. For audio, I've got a wireless mic on me. We only had one body pack that day, so I just ADR'd the doctor's lines and posts. We only had time for three takes, but a family ruined the first one, so we really only got two takes off before we had to run. We shot the second half of the parking lot scene at a completely different location. That location was the Pima Community College parking lot. <laughs> We chose this parking lot because it was the biggest, most well-lit parking lot in town. Relatively quiet, not a lot of cars, and we knew we could shoot there. No one's gonna give us any problems. However, it has this terrible, terrible sodium vapor lighting. Not much we can do about it. If we shoot here, we're not gonna be able to fix that in post. So, I mean, it is what it is. Oh yeah, and there's also the yucky color banding. Yeah, well, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. The shot here serves two purposes. We're establishing a new scene with the focus on Reggie, but we can also see that Dr. Laughlin is looking at the footage of Daryl. He went with a 50 mil lens here because we want a tight shot. So we get a nice close up of Reggie, but the field of view is wide enough so that we can stage and capture this foregrounded action of Dr. Laughlin. The idea is to really layer the image so you can tell the story more efficiently and get in and out of scenes without shooting a whole bunch of coverage and wasting people's time. We chose not to do a rack focus from Laughlin to Reggie because one, we want to keep the focus on Reggie and we could just use sound design here to help us tell the story. You'll know what Laughlin's looking at because we're going to insert the sounds of Daryl Lynn having her episode. Damon's backlighting me here with one of the street lamps. That's giving us a little separation, you know, so Reggie's not melting into the background. Loving the halation here at the top of the screen from the lamp. He also made sure to frame in some of these trees back here so we can get a lot of depth in that shot. In terms of lighting, we're popping in a little fill camera left with a b-board. Coverage here is typical shot reverse shot. Gave Reggie plenty of look space. No headroom here because, I mean, it's a pretty tight close up. We went with 85 millimeters here to really wipe out that background. Just crop a lot of stuff out. Your focus should just be on the characters, there's nothing else to see back there, it's just an empty parking lot. We don't have a lot of light to work with here, that's why we're using a prime lens, because we can open all the way up to 1.8 and just pull in as much light as possible, and we get the added benefit of that extra beautiful bulkaliciousness in the back there. We still got the fill light happening camera right from the b-board. We made sure to push it in nice and close and use the silver side so we can get that catch light. We hit Laughlin at 85 as well, matching close-ups. No need for backlighting for him because he's directly under the street lamp, giving us plenty of separation. He's just liberated from that background. Bounce car camera left for Phil Light, catch lights all up in his eyes. For the wide shot here, we wanted to show the gulf between Reggie and the doctor. They're on two totally different pages. In terms of framing, we're trying to capture that symmetry on both halves of the frame. We're using vanishing point perspective here to our advantage to guide your eye with leading lines to the obvious gap in the middle of the frame. All said and done, you know this ugly parking lot lighting scene actually ended up working out really well for us. Somehow it just kind of fit the mood. This grungy, icky lighting actually worked for the scene. <clears throat> we'll get back to the video in just a second. One second, thirsty. So let me get something to drink. Oh, almost forgot. This video is sponsored by Spiffy Gear. 
This is the Q6. This little guy is the successor to the Lumi lights, the wearable Cine lights. I spoke about Lumi lights in a prior video. Really dig what these spiffy gear cats are doing in the lighting space. The Q6 lights are basically Lumi lights, but completely reimagined. These lights come in two flavors. We got bicolor and RGB. Both flavors have five brightness settings. Both flavors come with pre-programmed lighting effects on all of the brightness settings, not just the max. The bicolor variant features a high CRI of 95, which means no weird color shifts. The RGB variant has three primary colors and a total of 12 secondary colors. One obvious use case, these guys are very handy for replacing practicals. And for the vloggers out there, these guys come in clutch for on-camera fill as well. Spiffy Gear also dropped a few accessories to go with these little monsters. There's the Q6 mount for light stands and on-camera use. And there's a three-way magnetic lighting panel so you can mount three of these lights at a time. Real talk, had these lights existed when we shot this movie, could have used it in a number of places, you know? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, would number of places. You've heard me say it before, you should always have some sort of ultra compact form factor light on set. That said, having wearable cine lights, kind of a no-brainer. Link below to the Spiffy Gear website. Should you decide to pick something up, be sure to use discount code spiffy for darius and get a 10% discount while you're at it. Just for you guys. Does that sound like a deal or what? Hashtag booyah. Back to the video. Speed, speed. Speed. 94A slash B. Take one. Why am I looking at 480, Zach? We ran dual cameras for the argument scene in the edit room. Each has a Canon 18 to 135 kit lens. The plan was to shoot the first half of the argument from the front, and then as things get heated, cover the second half of the argument from the back so we could show a sense of progression visually. We shot both angles on the day, but in the edit, we just ended up sticking with the back angle. We didn't even bother using the first two angles that we shot. I don't know what it is about them, it just didn't feel right. Good luck with your film. <laughs> he has nowhere to go. <laughs> Love the lighting in the scene, D. You nailed it. So Reg just had the worst day ever. He's finally getting an opportunity to catch a breath, and we want to capture that relatable moment. We went with a medium wide here because we're giving him that space in the frame. We're giving him room to breathe. This guy's decompressing. We don't need to be all up in his face with the camera to get it because the story is in his body language. Damon's hitting this at 35 mil. This is how far back he was to get the shot. Shooting through doorways for depth. Reggie falls into a third at position two, balancing out the refrigerator. Of course, we're going for the symmetry. We're always trying to capture that symmetry. We've got the vanishing point perspective going on. In this case, we're not using the lines to guide the eye anywhere specific. It just makes for a good frame. It's the lighting that makes the vibe though. Low key lighting, lots of contrast. The scene is supposed to look and feel quiet, peaceful. And I think we accomplished that. If we look at false color, we're way down there, bro. Practically everything is underexposed, but it's okay. That's the vibe we're going for. Proper exposure is just a tool, not a rule. The bounce light hitting the cabinet here is giving us just enough separation to prevent Reggie from completely melting into the background. The lighting is pretty simple here. We're just bouncing a mini mole light off the kitchen wall. D clamped the mini mole to this bracket right here with a gaffer clamp, and then he bounced the light off the wall. That whole lighting setup is imitating this light right here. And you may be asking yourself, well, why don't we just use this light? Well, it's not bright enough, it's too harsh, and we can't control the directionality of that light. Reggie meets Vic and gets more bad news. D hit us at 50 millimeters here so we could pull off these really dirty over the shoulder close up shots. Visually, we want to communicate a cramped, stuffy feeling. These men's backs are against the wall. Things aren't going as planned. Legally, it's not looking so good for Reggie. Reggie's back is literally against the wall. We could have cheated him forward to get more depth in the shot. That would have made for a much prettier shot, but that defeats the purpose. We don't want pretty shots. We want cramped shots. We're really hugging the eye line so we can see as much of the faces as possible. We've got an LED panel bringing him up so he's not a complete silhouette against that window. He's even got a little same LED panel on me here, camera right giving me a little fill. We're at 19 millimeters here, all natural lighting. We didn't have to do anything here. The window is doing all the heavy lifting. Love that quality of light you get standing next to a big window. The letter scene with the front office lady. I had my back to the window and Christina had her back to the weird funky looking wall. This arrangement didn't work because I've got dark skin and it's going to take a lot of fill light to bring me up to compete against that window behind me. And Christina just blends into the wall because her sweater and her skin tones, roughly the same colors. We fixed that problem by swapping positions. Christina has lighter skin tones. It's much 
much easier to bring her up to compete with that window. And because I've got darker skin and complementary colors on, I don't blend into that wall. I get much more separation. Also, did I mention how much we just hated that wall? Very ugly wall, jeez. So this shot is a part of the Reggie gathering evidence montage sequence. And uh, this shot wasn't planned, but I had to get it, bro, bro. I caught the one day that it was actually snowing in Tucson. That's a rarity out here. So in terms of composition, I stuck this tree here dead center of frame. The building, the walkway, and the stairs each occupy roughly a third. Not exact, but enough for the frame to feel balanced. I went as wide as I could at 18 millimeters here on a kit lens to pull in as much of this environment as possible to make you feel like you're actually there. We got plenty of leading lines pointing to the center of frame. I was actually very proud of this shot. Still am. Beautiful shot. Action. Here we wanted to capture solitude. His mom's in the hospital. We can feel her absence. He's home alone. These at 35 mil all the way out in the living room to get this shot. We kept the shot wide because we want to pull in as much of the living room as possible. He's by himself. Nobody else is home. The only light on in the house is in his room. So we kind of got to see enough of the rest of the house in the shot to communicate that. It's the shadow play in the negative space that's really setting the tone here. This is not a balanced frame at all, but it still feels good. Part of what makes the composition work, I think, is all of the shadow play in the negative space. But another part of it is the frame within a frame action we've got going here. I had Sound Team 6 in there booming me for audio. And for lighting, we just bounced a mini mole off a piece of white foam core. It key lit the whole room. GoPro drive laps. We don't see much of this guy here in the narrative. He plays like a minuscule role, like he's in all of two shots. Now this may be a small scene, but it's still an opportunity to add texture to this man and add texture to this world that we're building. Reggie's collecting a letter from this man to be used in court against his mother. D hit this at 32 millimeters, but we kept it wide so we can pull in all these beautiful details so we can get a sense of this man just by one image. Given all the computer stuff around, you can imagine this guy's occupation has something to do with computers. Maybe he programs. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what this guy's story is. All that really matters is that we are providing enough texture in this world that we're building for you all to fill in the blanks. This way, you guys get to take some ownership in the story we're telling. And this practical here is lighting the desk. It's also serving as a key light for the man. But we've got another one by one LED panel hidden away back here, taped against the wall, acting as a key for Reggie and a fill for that back wall. Boom mic overhead for audio. This scene here was supposed to be a crying scene, but that didn't happen. Yeah, you know what, rather than explain it, I'm just gonna show you. Keep your eye open. <laughs> See pieces flying up in your face. Jinx it does, just like... The next step will work this one. Yeah, I cut the wrong side. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, God, <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> 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 I held it way too close, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing it with a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like... <laughs> I'm looking at the shot and also I see his arm, he's just waving my face like a Jedi mind trick. I can get it, I can get it, I know I can get it. Yeah, 11 takes later, I didn't get it. But that's okay, because we wound up cutting the scene anyway. Alright, this is 104C, and 104A, take one. Okay, let's see what this guy does. Action. So how are you doing, man? We ran dual cameras on this scene. We shot Zach's close up in this wide shot here first because we could do those in the same lighting setup. We've got a 1K outside the sliding glass door here. It's keying Zach and it's edge lighting me. This is supplementing the sunlight that's already coming through that door. And we've got a Chimera softbox camera left giving me some fill. Without that fill light, this is how dark I'd be. Funny enough, we had to change the lighting around more than we would like to for my close ups. Look right here. Ready for it? Boom. <laughs> It's like completely different. Usually you wanna avoid this type of inconsistent lighting, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. It's not the end of the world. The way that I'm lit for the wide just doesn't work in the close up. Love the lighting here, man. We got the far side key happening. That fill is really killing it. Got that backlight. Damon, why are you such a beast, bro? Thanks, man. But I digress. Why in the world did we light this differently? We shot both close ups of Reggie at the same time, so the lighting setup we use has to work for both angles. This is why we had to change the lighting. We got a blue gel Chimera softbox keying me camera left. We got a reflector on the other side for some fill action. And we've got the 1K kicker in the back giving me some separation. We went with the blue gel because it's imitating the light coming from this window, which is also blue. 
because we gelled it so. This three point setup looks good for both the profile close up and the classic head and shoulders close up. And now you may be asking why two different color windows? <laughs> It just looked better. This was our game plan for covering the scene. At the top of the scene, we cover both Zach and Reggie in matching profile shots. These two guys are not on the best of terms. I mean, they're kind of beefing at this point. And profile shots are indicative of a showdown. As the scene progresses, we move into traditional coverage. We don't want to be too heavy handed with the profile shots here. Gotta mix it up, mix it up, mix it up. In terms of blocking, this was our strategy. Reggie needs something from Zach. He needs a letter. Got it. Position one. We decided to have Zach standing at the beginning of the scene because he's in a position of power. He has the resource Reggie needs. Reggie is in a position of need. He does not have the power in the scene. So we start the scene off with him sitting. Visually, he's in a lower position. He's gotta look up to Zach. But once Reggie realizes he's not gonna get what he came for, things change. No more, man. I'm not at your beck and call anymore. Wow. Wow. From this point forward, Reggie decides, you know, I kinda don't want that letter anymore, bro. Which would also mean he's no longer in a position of need, right? So we used blocking to articulate that moment. Position two. Reggie stands meeting Zach at his level. Both men are equal, neither needs the other. As far as this scene is concerned, not talking about the rest of the movie, the scene. We carry the rest of the scene out with these two fellas looking at each other eye to eye. Oh yeah, quick, quick note about the wide shot. This wide shot we have here is not here to establish anything. We only threw this shot in there to communicate the rift or the distance between these two men. Zach's on one end of the frame, Reggie's on another. The distance between them is the rift. Five, eight, take two, marker. Get quiet, please. We were crazy lucky to get this hospital location. Not going into it here, I already talked about it in the documentary. These all the way at the other end of the hallway on a 50 mil lens to compress the space. We're gonna have a couple nurses walk the halls in the shot and if we're on too wide a lens, they're gonna look too small on the frame. Also, leading lines all day, every day. The lights in here, bruh bruh, yuck. These fluorescent lights here obviously have a very green cast. I mean, stupid green. Like, look what it's doing to the skin tones here. Yuck. We don't have the means to relight the space. So we turned every light off except for the one at the end of the hall and the one right above up Darlin's room and it helped. So most of the lights coming from this far window over here, we got some glare on the walls there and we don't have as much color temperature mixing. It ain't perfect, but we'll take it. For Darlin's room here, we uh, gotta limit how much of the room we show cause we don't have money for set dressing. For lighting, D rigged up some LED panels to raise the ambient light level of the room. We know we're not gonna see this wall in a shot anyway. And this little bugger back here is to pop a little something on our would be nurse's feet in the following shot. Perfect. Sit up. We were boom, in and out. Shot everything at the hospital in a few hours. Action. <laughs> the second hospital visit, this was, this was kind of a long scene. We had to break this scene up into different beats and articulate those beats with blocking and framing. Beat number one, greetings. In terms of blocking, they are both on the same level. We stay wide dramatically, things are chill. We're building up to the next beat. When Reggie takes a seat, this starts beat number two, the attack. We move in for close-ups here. Things are starting to get serious. Darylin goes into an offensive position. In terms of visual storytelling, she's standing. She has the higher ground. She's looking down on Reggie from a dominant space. And Reggie's on the defense. He's got the lower ground looking up at her. She has all the power in this moment. When Darylin takes a seat, we move into beat number three, the negotiation. Darylin realizes she can't get what she wants by intimidation. So she resorts to reasoning. She gets down on his level. The blocking echoes this. We stick with the close-ups to keep the pressure on. As the scene progresses, we see the power shift from Darylin to Reggie. When none of her tactics work, she dismisses herself. For the opening shot of this scene, we want to establish this space here with some depth. Damon's kind of angling on these little columns here so we can see these descending layers into the background. No lighting going on here. These are all house lights. For the Cowboy 2 shot here, we've got the one by one LED panel on the ground, angled up at us, giving us some bottom fill. This is the scene before lighting. Notice the top down lighting, very harsh, giving us raccoon eyes and unflattering shadows. Not very cinematic. Also, the background is way brighter than the subject. In this case, uh. You know, a little distracting. So we cut the main house lights off and added an LED panel camera right for key. So much better, fam. So much better. We still left some of the house lights on for ambient fill. And they looked dope as out of focus practicals. But now the actors are front and center here. We don't have those distracting overhead lights. For the wide shots, we left all of the house lights on. But for the close-ups, we turned 70% of the house lights off. That's a pretty big change in lighting, fam. That's a huge change. But you know how many people noticed? 
zero. And even if they did notice, nobody cares as long as it feels good. We ran both the close-ups double dragon. By that, I mean two camera. We also key lit Reggie with that same LED panel. Catch Light City. For all of Darylin's coverage, we're at 195 millimeters because we want to eradicate that background. We're gonna make sure you're focused on Darylin and nothing else. But also, nah, you already know what I'm saying. I, I ain't gonna say it. I ain't gonna say it. K -k 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 Catch Light City. We end the scene on a stupid tight close-up of Reggie in profile because first off we want to end on the emotion put a nice button on the end of the scene carrying us into the next scene we took a profile so it feels more candid almost like you're sitting in the room with him and you just looked over so we get the best of both worlds it feels like we get all of the benefits of a really tight close-up but we're not all up in his face also at 195 that background is a creamy creamy mess you are the C crew that's you there it is Unsound, baby. FYI, this was around the time we had the title change from Seafood Tester to Unsound. Okay, stack of paper. We wanted a wide shot here as Reggie's packing his things just to give you more of a sense of the guy. I mean, the movie's been go, 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 and we haven't even seen his room or that much about him. Pulling off this shot was a bit of a challenge, man. Again, with the small spaces thing. Trying to get just good, compelling shots in small rooms, man. It's really tough. We're on the 18 to 135 here. We had to put the camera on the freaking windowsill, and even then, we just barely got the shot. One of the few times we had to use an external monitor. Also, do you notice anything funny about the lights? Maybe like how it will be impossible for them to be lighting the room because none of the lamp bulbs are pointing into the room. Yeah, this broken lamp is just a motivated lighting source. This Chimera softbox just outside of frames doing all the heavy lifting. This is how we got this shot. Rigged the 60 up on a C-stand, threw the boom mic on a boom buddy, and the Chimera for key. This ridiculous lamp is still the motivated light source. Ah, the memorabilia scene. I like this scene. The frame is quite literally separated into thirds. That's a balanced frame, boys and girls. We've also got some frame within frame action happening. Reggie's kind of boxed into that last third. He occupies the brightest part of the frame. Our eye goes right to him. We lit the scene with the chimera. The motivating light source is the ceiling fan. The egg crate here is acting like a scrim, knocking some light down on that wall. The gap here, oh so carefully placed by Damon, is giving me more light because I got that dog skin. Darkness. This two-stop flag here, we flew it in to knock down the light on the wall. For sound, we threw the mic on a boom buddy so Tina could just focus on levels. We're on the Canon 18 to 135 kit lens, and the camera's about 12 feet away to get the shot. The sound you hear at the very beginning of the scene, that's me turning on the Chimera. <laughs> that doesn't sound anything like a light switch on a wall, but I left the sound in there because I thought it was funny. You know, a little inside joke. All these insert shots here we shot at 75 mil. So this slider shot is one of the few dynamic moving shots we have in the entire film. The scene starts with Reggie having feelings of nostalgia and appreciation. And as the scene progresses, we see the emotional arc move into deep worry and concern. Having this really slow, subtle push in here is a nice way for us to highlight that moment. As you may have already guessed, I wasn't watching a TV. I was staring at a couple of hands waving in front of an LED panel, bro. To get the shot, we mounted the 60D on a hi-hat and a cheap slider. I don't remember what brand it was. Reframing, ISO. One more. Again. Same, same direction. Other way. Okay, bring it back. To get the headlights effect, we had Travis just outside the window swinging a mini mall. Zach's letter. We're gonna build our lighting scheme around this light. This is what the scene looks like with no lighting. And to use not one, but two Home Depot work lights to light the scene. Here's the lighting scheme. So for the first part of the scene, when Reggie exits the apartment, we've got a work light in the living room serving as a backlight on Reggie and another work light just outside the front door bouncing off the wall as a key light. This guy right here, it's gonna key light both of us. Top of the scene, Reggie opens the door, backlit by that work light in the house. He sees Zach in front of him, whom is being keyed by the second work light bouncing off the wall. Reggie steps out of the house into position two, and now he's keyed by the same work light. Boom. Worth noting, we do have a bounce card camera left for Phil on Reggie here, and we've got a bounce card camera right for Zach. For the medium two shot here, we had to move some lights around. We moved the first light back about five feet and bounced it against the opposite wall. Now it's serving as more of a far side key for Reggie and a backlight for Zach. And we moved the second light outside behind camera bounced it off another wall. This is gonna be a key light for Zach as he walks off frame. Work light one's doing all the work here, bouncing off the wall. 
And then as Zach exits, boom, he gets picked up by that second light. He walks right into a nice, soft key light. This walk away action right here is the reason why we went with over 100 millimeters for this shot. That lens compression allows us to see more of Zach walking away before he actually exits frame. This gives us an opportunity to catch that beat where Reggie watches his best friend walk away from him. Is this the end of the road for these two guys? We don't know. So we got this big court scene coming up we gotta get you guys geared up for. In order to build up to this court scene, we have to leave you all with a trail of breadcrumbs so you're nice and primed and ready for that scene when we get there. These next three scenes are all about courtroom build up. It is the morning of court. This was one of our pickup shots I recorded myself here. I'm using the Canon Nifty 50. No artificial lighting here. This is all natural light. I shot this early in the morning, just before sunrise. So we get that nice even lighting outside. I've got a mic on a mic stand just outside of frame over here for audio. In terms of framing, I divided the frame into equal thirds, roughly close enough. I put Reggie's eyes on that top third to give my man plenty of headroom in the frame. Obviously you can't see this, but I wore a white tank top so that the light coming through that window would bounce off my shirt into the room. So you can see the light bouncing onto the wall there, a little onto the bed, giving us that separation down at the bottom. Love, love, love how that light is just falling off around Reggie. I was going for the dance of shadows in this scene because it gave me an opportunity to work in some blocking in a visually interesting way. At the top of the scene, we can see someone stirring about the room. Our audience gets to guess, just for a second, who is this person, where are we right now, and what is this person doing? And then this shadowy figure frames himself in the window, thus answering the question, this is Reggie, we're in his room, he just opened a window. We've got a dynamic scene in terms of visuals, and we didn't have to move the camera. The necktie scene, we got a little abstract here, no particular reason, it just felt right. In case you can't tell what you're seeing here, we're shooting into a wavy mirror. Why did we use this shot? Well, I wish I could give you some bullshit film metaphor, but truth be told, I own one of those wavy Ikea mirrors and I always wanted to use it in a shot, bro. <laughs> so Damon and I just found a way to work this shot somewhere in here in the movie and it just felt right for this scene. 128, take five. Renew. So we shot this entire sequence at magic hour slash golden hour. For audio, we've got a lavalier taped to the cabin of the car. Damon's at 18 millimeters in the back seat. We're wide enough to get the whole front windshield. That is the focus of the shot. We've got some ND6 taped to the windshield. It's reducing the light coming through that windshield by about two stops so we could expose for Reggie and everything still looks good. You can see the tape right there. We did a crap job taping it, but the car is so ragged like no one would notice anyway. We tilted the rear view mirror here so that you could see Reggie's eyes through the duration of the shot. What really miffs me though, is you can see this late in the entire shot. It's right there. <laughs> the best take by far for performance has the slate in the entire freaking shot. I was pissed. This was one of those shots, bro, where once you nail the performance, you're not redoing it. I tried to remove it in post, wasn't happening. So I said, F it, we're just gonna press on and see what happens. Things like this happen all the time. It's the nature of the beast. And I'm happy to say no one's ever noticed it. Not, on, and not in festivals, not online, not one person has commented. Story-wise, this is an important moment for Reggie, right? He's about to do the toughest thing he's had to do in the story, up to this point anyways. We figured the best way to pull the audience into Reggie's predicament is to allow them to share this moment with him uninterrupted. So we shot the whole sequence looking through that front windshield. No edits. Slice of life as if you're actually there with him on the journey to the courtroom. this moment, Reggie has handled everything in stride, been very level-headed. This is the moment where we finally see a crack in that armor. We wanted this to feel like a real moment, not a movie moment. Going in for close-ups and coverage here would have been the movie thing to do. But Dee and I decided, you know, let's trust our audience here. Let's show some restraint. Let's stay in the car the whole time and, and watch the biggest moment through that front windshield. Let it go wide. Trust the body language. Trust the tone we've built. Trust the performance. Just let it ride. I'm happy to say, we took a big risk here and it worked. This wound up being one of the strongest moments in the film. And now looking back on it, kind of feels like it couldn't have been shot any other way. Well, I don't want to be obvious here, but we can't have a court scene without a courtroom. And we still got that no money for extras or locations thing going. So once again, we had to turn to the film department. 
We shout out the whole court scene in one of the conference rooms. The streets. I own the streets. <laughs> that was awesome. Your finger came in focus. It was like, bam! That was okay to be leaving. I just didn't want you to be so The courtroom scene. Here we are. We cover this scene in two extreme close-ups. This is the closest we've gotten to either of these characters so far in the film. We save the extreme close-ups for this moment. For lighting, we're just using the house lights. We do have a piece of foam core at 12 o'clock. It is supplying a little fill, but the main reason we have it there is for the eye light. Without that little action in my eyes there, my eyes would be too dark and you guys would feel an emotional disconnect because you can't see into my eyes. Por ejemplo, here's that same shot with no eye light. Feels kind of vacuous, right? Like empty, like something's missing. If we look at them side to side, which one do you feel more of a connection to? I'll wager that probably for most of you, it's gonna be the one on the right. These eyes look dead and cold, and these eyes look full of life. We did the same thing for Tornay's close-up, extra attention to those eyes. Before we rolled camera, we spent a good 15 minutes just doing PD for the eyes. We placed a B-board to the left on the table here to fill out that left side. We threw up one of those standing whiteboard things to fill out the right side. We opened up the blinds to the right. It's all about getting that crystal ball effect. We're lucky Tornay has such big, beautiful, emotive eyes. Like that made our job really easy. From a directing standpoint, when your close-ups are this tight, bruh, bruh, you don't want your actors doing a lot because it's going to come across as overacting. Every blink is going to read like gangbusters. You almost don't want them to do anything <laughs> because it's such a fine line. Help your actors out. Make sure those eyes are nice and bright. You'll thank yourself later. D hit both of our close-ups at 50 millimeters. We are obliterating that background because we are so close to camera. You can see how shallow that focus is. My eyes are in focus here, but my ears are not very shallow. This scene should feel almost like a dream or rather a nightmare. Unreal. That's why we shot it this way. We wanted to place you guys right in the middle of the drama. So we had the actors look directly into camera. It doesn't get any more intimate than this. And also the added benefit of covering the entire scene in extreme close-ups is we mask the fact that we could not afford to get a real courtroom location and fill it with extras. Hey, this is indie film. You gotta make 10 cents look like a dollar, man. Post courtroom scene here. We shot this in the same building. We actually shot it in the same room as the Zach and Reggie planning scene. We just set up a shot by the window, zoomed in and cropped out everything that we didn't wanna see. As far as the audience is concerned, they can't miss what's not there, right? Better not to show a courtroom at all and just place you in the space with sound design than to show a poorly executed one. The makeup scene between Zach and Reggie, this was a mess to shoot. The first time we shot it, just eh, didn't really land with us. The only thing good that came out of it was this. Rolling. Speed. Go. 123 beat. I'm not. <laughs> 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 But on a serious note, we decided like we needed to reshoot it a year later while we were doing reshoots. And uh, yeah, you know, I changed my mind and decided, you know, we need to shoot this scene in a bar to open up the film. We got one too many scenes happening in houses. As luck would have it, there was a hole in the wall bar right down the street from my house that I was pretty darn sure they'd, they'd be cool with us shooting a little something in there. I ran it by the owners. They were totally down, but they can't close the bar down for us. Snap. So we don't have complete control over the location. They were open for business the day we were shooting. We had to negotiate people coming in and out of the bar between shots, but we did get free extras out of it. Here's the plan. Establish the scene on a small detail. While we catch Zach doing his thing in a close-up, we'll foreground someone setting down a beer. The whole point of capturing the beer set down in this close-up here is that Zach doesn't know who set this beer down. At this moment, we're telling the story from Zach's perspective and this angle reflects that. For a brief moment, it's a mystery to him. We answer the question of who set the beer down with a cut. Reggie did. A little shot, reverse shot, leave both these guys on a wide shot. Doing their thing, burying the hatchet, relieving all tension between these two, both visually and narratively. We only added one light for the wide shot. D rigged up a cheap pan light, you know, like the ones you get at Home Depot. And it gave us a little, little something, something to work with on the right side of the frame here because it was looking kind of naked. Of course, we went for that symmetry. You know how we do, always hunting for that symmetry. And we've got plenty of leading lines directing your eye right to where the action is in the middle of frame. For the lighting on my close up here, the key light is obviously the bounce light coming off the pool table. The drop light you see on the dartboard there, that's that pan light. The backlight on me here, that's a mini wall. It's given us some separation from the background. 
the light on the dartboard, it's a little bright, a little hot. Had we more time, we would have adjusted it, but we started shooting while Damon was still lighting. That's why the kicker light was acting all kinds of crazy in the film. <laughs> we weren't done lighting yet. Just for reference, here's what that shot would have looked like with no lighting. And there's Damon back there. And that would be the I'm grabbing focus on myself to get ready to roll dance. Ah, uh, filmmaking. For the reverse, we're key lighting Zach with the same bounce light off the pool table. We turned this bathroom light on here to add some depth to the space. This neon sign here, a house light by the way, is giving us some really good separation. In terms of framing, we could have shot them against any wall in this bar, but that's why we chose this one. That light back there is doing a lot of work for us and we didn't have to set it up. This was my favorite transition shot in the entire movie. And no, it wasn't planned. D just improvised this on the day. And it's great, love it. So this is the point where we transition from the feature film shoot into the short film shoot which happened almost a year prior. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the documentary, explained it all there. Link below. All right, I'm rolling. Audio roll. Roll audio. Scene 2A, take one, mark. So let's talk about this extreme wide shot here. First off, I love the framing. We've got symmetry on left and right. We've got leading lines pointing to the center of frame here. Everything about this shot says Tucson. It really captures the desert with the tan boxy buildings and the flatness. After debating on the best way to shoot the scene to capture the core of it, Damon and I figured the best way to communicate the rift between Daryl and Reggie is to literally show it in an extreme wide shot. She walks across this huge frame, leaving Reggie in the dust, doesn't even bother looking over her shoulder. We're about 40 feet away to get the shot. We use the Canon kit lens zoomed out to 22 millimeters with a polarizer. The arrival home. For lighting, we threw up an eight by to block the sun. We're flagging the sun out of frame to control the contrast. We're on the kit lens for the scene. We threw in some fill light with a b-board. Sound team six picked us up from the top of the stairs. We decided not to shoot any coverage of Daryl in the scene. At this point in the film, part of the suspense is wondering what she'll do next. By holding back on her, this is an opportunity for us to let the tension build. The closest we get to Daryl is a medium shot. Plus, this scene is all about the body language anyways. What she does to Reggie speaks for itself. She's got me at 32 millimeters here. We want to make it look like a picture. I love how I'm hopping out of one frame into another. I know, film nerd, whatever. For lighting, we got an eight by about 10 feet away, giving us that bounce action plate. Beautiful, large, soft source of light. When she hops back into those boots, she's reclaiming her identity. That's why the shot is here. I picked these boots specifically because they say a lot about her character. She's combative, she's a fighter, and these are butt kicking shoes. She could have wore any of her other shoes, but she picked these boots. A little foreshadowing here. She's getting ready for a fight. For lighting, we got a guy uh, bouncing in some fill from the window. In order to get low enough, we set the camera on a pancake and uh, yeah, that was that. For the male scene, we wanted to cover this whole scene in one shot. We want to give the audience a voyeur's point of view where you can watch life play out before your eyes with no cuts. Think fly on the wall. And we're shooting through doorways once again to add depth to the shot because small apartment. We took a risk on shooting everything really dark in here. There is no fill light. We thought it felt right, it matches the vibe, so we went with it. We held on this shot and let the entire scene play out because we want you to forget the camera even exists. What really pulls this shot together from a lighting standpoint is that both characters are silhouetted against that back window. The scene plays out like a dance of shadows. Speed. 10B-3, <clears throat> take one, mark. For the injection scene here, we don't show you any of the surroundings. No establishing shot, no nothing. Because the environment doesn't matter. This scene is all about what's happening between Daryl and Reggie. It's about the words that aren't being spoken. That's why we went with extreme close-ups here. I'm gonna use sound design to build the space anyways. We wanted to pull the audience so close to the characters that you could almost feel them thinking. And also, we wanted to put you right in the middle of the drama by having the characters look right at camera. Technically, this is breaking the fourth wall, but you know that the characters are looking at each other, so it's not jarring. We can see Reggie's eyes. We have access to him, but we don't have the same access to Daryl. She's got those shades on. She's blocking Reggie out, and she's also blocking us out. Again, we're using wardrobe here to help tell the story. The final scene with Vic, the caseworker. It's kind of funny because this is actually one of the first scenes we shot of the entire movie. This is what we did. We're covering the scene from Reggie's perspective. He's the third wheel in the conversation. Vic and Daryl are talking about him as if he's not there. We want to mimic Reggie's vantage point, so we're covering these two in profile shots. This approximates his POV, right? Because he'd be seeing these two in profile. By hitting the scene this way, we're asking the audience, you guys, to identify with his subjective experience. Because it sucks to be talked about as if you're not in the room, right? For lighting, we've got a 20 light key lighting Daryl, and we've got a mini mall on Vic. 
these are the key lights. The window back here is the motivated lighting source. So these lights are imitating window light. We've got some quarter CTP gel on these lights to cool them off because these are warm lights. And we've got some diffusion to soften them up just a hair. Usually we'd put the lights outside and light the actors through the windows, but that wasn't an option seeing as we're on the fifth floor. We did a dual camera setup here, two Canon 60Ds. We're hitting both actors at 50 mil, matching coverage. For audio, we're running a boom, but we're also running a wireless plant right here, just outside of frame. This omnidirectional lav mic's just a backup in case we're not getting what we want from the boom. It will pick up both factors, and I think it works. Uh, you know, it reads as Reggie's POV. Now, taking a couple of notes on composition here. First off, all those white papers in the back, we place them there. Serves as production design, but also it helps us get some separation between Vic and that background, because he's essentially silhouetted against those white papers. And we're shooting Daryl in against these black drawers again for separation. Light skin, dark cabinets, yada yada. We love both actors, plenty of look space, and aside from the shot being profile, everything else is fairly conventional. And for the reverse on Reggie, remember, this is from his point of view, so we want to see more of his face. So we're hitting him with a classic close-up, head and shoulders. We're popping off two lights here. For the key light, we have a tweeny imitating that window light. And for Phil, we have a mini mole. Both lights blue gelled and diffused. Separation, not a problem here, right? Black dude sitting against a white wall. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how we covered this scene. We got everything shot out in about four hours. The bathroom brawl. This was a tough scene to film. Here's the game plan. Given that we're actually fighting in the scene, there's a certain degree of unpredictability. So lights, cameras, all manner of filmmaking accoutrement needs to be out of the way so we have room to do our thing. For lighting, we've got one mini mole on the bathroom counter. We're bouncing that little guy off the ceiling. And we've got mini mole number two hidden in the shower, bouncing off the ceiling as well. To bring up the general ambience in the bathroom, the mini moles are imitating these vanity lights right here. They are the motivated lighting source. This setup gives us plenty of room to do our thing. Our ideal source of audio is gonna be boom sound but we are using the wireless systems as a backup. Sound Team 6 rigged up the backup lab so that it would hang just outside of frame. Hit the transmitter in the medicine cabinet. We shot day for night so we blacked out the windows with Duvetine. What's going on in the scene? Daryl Lynn's packing her stuff, she wants to dip. Reggie is standing in her way. He doesn't want her to leave, he's not moving out of the way. She feels trapped. So how can we use our framing to visually communicate some of these underlying emotions? Here's what we did. We've got a 44 millimeter head and shoulders close up on Reggie and a wide shot at 39 mil with a Canon kit lens. This is gonna get the entire scene. We're using shadow to create a box, a frame within a frame. This should help communicate that trapped feeling. And there's only one way in and one way out of that bathroom. Here is the final frame for the wide shot. We decided not to shoot any coverage of Daryl because we wanna keep her inside that box. No close up shots of her, no nothing. The only time you're seeing Daryl in this scene is inside of that box. When she fights her way out of that bathroom, she's also breaking her way out of the frame we locked her in. We did seven grueling takes of this. Torne had bruises, I had bruises, but we got it. By far, one of the hardest scenes to shoot. Are you gonna watch? Huh? Get out of my way! Get out! For the medicine cabinet shot, we had roughly the same lighting setup. I hit this with a 50 mil, I think. Here's the plan. We want to use a montage sequence to amp up the pace leading into the climax of the film. We're going to cut between Daryl and packing her stuff and Reggie out in the living room setting up a blockade. It's all about quick cuts and tight shots because we don't want to reveal what Reggie's up to until Daryl leaves the room. We blacked out the bedroom window again, day for night. For this scene, we want this lamp to be the motivated lighting source for everything that happens in this room. One problem with that. This is a tiny room, not much room for lighting. This shot right here is going to be problematic. Somebody standing in front of a lamp. Because we are shooting into the corner of the room, that that complicates things. We gotta light this subject without splashing light all over the walls or raising the ambient light of the room. It took us about 45 minutes to figure out how to light it, and by we I mean Damon, because I had better things to do like drink soda. Here's what we did. We flew in a mini mole on a C-stand behind Tornay, blasted it into the gold side of a reflector. The resulting bounce gave us what we were looking for, a hot far side key that looks like it could be coming from that lamp. And on the other side of the bed, we have another mini mole with some diffusion for Phil. Yes, my friend, the shot is only one second long. 
45 minutes of lighting for a one second shot. It, it, it's filmmaking. You've got to get really creative when you're trying to light in small rooms because you just don't have the space. But we got it, we figured it out. We're not totally happy with it, but it works. For the packing the bag shot, we've got two lights working here. We've got a gelled mini mole on a C stand with some diffusion. This is our far side key. Again, imitating that lamp. We've got another mini mole here for Phil. We're going for harsh lighting here. We took the shot at 50 mil, moving on. Rummaging through the closet, we only needed one light here. Mini mole on a C stand, again, this light is imitating the lamp in the room. All of my shots in the montage sequence, yeah, I shot it solo. We ran out of time on the day, so we skipped over all of my solo shots because I knew I could always come back and pick them up later on my own. B1, take one. A1, take two. Three R, take one. In case you haven't noticed, I was having the best time of my life. There was no dual pixel autofocus then. To grab focus, I had to do it the old fashioned way. Okay, this is how we lit the shot. The ceiling fan lights here serve as one of the motivated lighting sources for everything that takes place in the living room. We're imitating the ceiling fan light here with a 1K. In this case, the 1K is serving as a far side key. The return to the room here, the lighting is super broad, obviously. We're hitting her on the broad side because technically this is where that lamp light would be hitting her. The window shot, another tricky shot for lighting. To pull the shot off, we had a three light setup. For the nuclear key light to the side here, imitating that lamp, we've got a mini mole with some diffusion. And we've got another diffused mini mole aimed at that back wall, bringing up the ambient light in the room. It's hitting that back wall right here. Just think of it as lamp light bouncing around the room. And for light number three, we've got a tweeny shooting off a bounce board right outside the window, camera left. Of course, it's dimmed all the way down, but that bounce is aimed right at her face just to kick in a little fill in there. Of course, you can see the light in her shades. It ain't perfect, but you know what? Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. The biggest challenge we had with the living room scene was working with the limited space we had to get the compositions we were looking for. Difficult, yes, but not impossible. For the reverse angle here, we have a 1K and a 20 light camera right. The 1K's for the background, the 20's for me. It's serving as a short side key. And camera left, we have a 20 light for Phil. Here's that same setup without the fill light on. Notice the contrast, too much, too much. You can't even see my face. And with the fill on, we get the same edgy moodiness, but we can see everything we need to see. But the beautiful part is right down the middle, we've got that darkness. That moody lighting, give me all of it. Second angle here, this is without the far side key, and this is with the far side key. Big difference. The wide shot in the living room, we went with a low angle to empower both characters. It just felt right. This is a big moment for both of them. They both come so far in their journeys. For lighting, 1K, camera left as far side key. And for Phil, we have a 20 light, camera right. This is the shot with just the key light on. And with Phil, this is the final result. For the laptop screenshot here, surprise, surprise, we used a light. I mean, we used a light for everything, guys. It's all fake. That's why filmmaking takes so long. The laptop screen is maxed out on brightness, still not enough for camera to pick it up. I don't know where D got these strip light things, but they work perfect. Auto zoom. Oh. Here's the shot without the lights. It doesn't, doesn't even look like she's looking at a laptop because we don't have any speculars in the eyes, no catch lights, no nothing. But then when you throw the lights on, boom, shot comes alive. For the home video footage segment, we shot that on another day. No crew, just Torne and I. Production design took three hours. This is the fourth and final time I'd have to trash my place. We filmed for about four hours, and then it was another three hours for Teardown. I shot everything on the Canon Power Shot. This was all improv. None of this was scripted. All of the audio is from the Canon Power Shot. It's supposed to be gritty, messy, and ugly, like home video footage. To complete the sequence, we needed a store to crash, and I had a place in mind, right around the corner from my house. Go ahead. Did you lock the door? Yeah. Just, just walk like you're on a mission, as if there was nobody there. Okay. Keep walking. Okay. Keep walking. Uh, action. Mom, you have to pay for those. Hello. Excuse me. Mom, you have to pay for Excuse those. Excuse me, you have to pay Mom, for that. Mom, I'm sorry, ma'am. Excuse me. No, I don't. Mom. Yes, you do. No, I don't. That was good. Yes, brother. The checkout lady knew exactly what we were doing. Of course I talked to her. I'm not trying to catch charges over a movie. Post 
closed footage introspection. For this shot here, the final shot of this scene, here's our setup. We've got three lights going to get the final look. This twinny right here is our fill. We've got a 1K for a far side key. This other twinny here is backlighting the furniture and popping a little light on the floor. This area right here, that's all it's lighting. And we've got the light flagged off to prevent it from spilling anywhere else we don't want it. Far side key, fill light, background twinny light. If we look at false color here, technically, man, a majority of her face is underexposed. It's a dark scene, bro. It's supposed to be moody. Since we're not shooting in log, then it's fine. By shooting her with this slightly over the shoulder profilish angle here, we're just kind of eavesdropping in on this moment. We're stealing a little bit of this moment with her. We don't need to be all up in her face with this close up. We get it. The final scene, bruh bruh, we made it. This was the game plan. We wanna cover this whole scene in a wide. By going with one uninterrupted wide shot, we get that slice of life feel. This is a big moment for these two characters and we wanna experience that moment real time with them. Also, just holding these two characters in the same frame after all of the battling we've seen says a lot. Let's talk lighting. We've got a 2K at the top of the stairs. It's a kicker light. It's just imitating these front door lights at the top of the stairs. We're never gonna see them. But that 2K action's really giving us some separation. Just look at my shoulders, bro. I am liberated from the background. I am in 3D. For the key light, we've got a Chimera camera left imitating a neighbor's porch light. This flag here is just keeping the light from spilling onto the wall. This Chimera serves as my key light, but it also works as a key light for Tournay in positions two, and three. We've got another tweeny on this tree back here. This pool of light right here, that's from a tweeny up top hanging over the railing. That light back there is giving the shot some depth. Without it, it's distractingly dark back there. That's not it, we got two more lights. Little sneaky fellas, we got two tweenies blasting from my living room out that window. These lights are here to give Tornay a little something something while she's walking out that door to position two. We use more lights in this scene than any other scene in the film. We were pulling 3,250 watts worth of power to light this scene. Of course that pales in comparison to Hollywood, but it's a lot for an indie film and it was a lot for us. It took about an hour and a half to light everything, work out the blocking, rehearse it. Lots of prep to get everything right because remember, this is one wide shot. There is no coverage. There is no other shot to cut away to to hide mistakes or compress the time if the pacing's too slow. It has to work timing wise, blocking, lighting, everything. Let's talk about camera. On paper, we had every reason to stay wide, but shooting zero coverage is a very scary thing. So we rolled off some additional angles with B cam in the unlikely case that we would need it. B cam is about 60 feet away and about a foot off the ground on a 55 mil lens. We don't intend to use the footage from this camera. We rolled it because we had it. Why not make a backup? However, A cam is all the way back here on the Sigma 70 to 300, zoomed all the way into 300 mil. That is a lot of lens compression. A couple of reasons for this choice. We wanna flatten the image as much as possible to get that picture hanging on a wall look. Two, because there is so much lens compression, we won't have a problem making out the faces even in this wide shot. And mind you, we're using a crop sensor camera. So this 300 mil is more like a 480 mil on a full frame sensor. That's a lot of lens compression, bro. And in terms of framing, there's enough going on to hold the audience's attention because they get to look back and forth between these two characters as the scene plays out. And for the final reason, bro, bro, we're telling the story through the blocking here. There is no dialogue. By staying wide, we keep the focus on the body language. Looking at framing and composition here, we're dividing the frame in half literally with that stair railing. Symmetry on left and right. The shadows really make the tone here. At the end of position two, she falls into shadow. She's conflicted. And we're communicating this not just through the blocking and the acting, but the lighting as well. This is B cam. We're at 55 millimeters on this camera. Now we still have some lens compression happening, just nowhere near the amount of compression as A cam. You can really see what that lens compression is doing when you compare these two shots. Now granted, both these cameras are about 20 feet away from each other, so there's definitely a difference in perspective, but there's so much compression with that 300 that this this almost looks like a fake movie set. Rolling. All right, it's 29 DNF, mark one. Yeah. All right, I'll collect this one. The last moment here, mother and son sharing a black and mild. This is a bookend. It echoes the very first scene, but something has changed, hasn't it? At the start of the film, we saw Daryl Lynn smoking alone in the darkness. And here we find her smoking again, but she's not alone anymore. These two images summarize the entire film. These two images summarize the journey for both of these characters. Daryl Lynn's journey has been one of self-discovery. The reality that she has defended for years has just disintegrated right before her eyes. Coping with this will be incredibly difficult. 
and she cannot do it alone. For Reggie, this was a journey of resilience. Love is not black and white, but rather an ocean of difficult choices and sacrifice. Along the way, he's learned that cruelty and kindness can come from the same place, because sometimes helping a loved one means hurting them. And despite all of the trials and tribulations and fighting, their journeys have brought them here, together, on these steps, sharing a smoke. We don't know what the future holds for these two, but here's what we do know. They've got each other, and that's all that matters. By design, the opening image and the closing image are mirrors of each other. This is the second time I used the distant train in the sound design. The wheels of change have come around once again. I'm using this as an audio cue to echo the first scene, bring us back to that opening moment. It's meant to further reinforce how the opening image and the closing image mirror each other, but in the differences between the two images lies the heart of the film. 